Welcome everybody to the rare and mythic Lord of the Rings Limited Love Love Set Review. I'm Alex, joined once again on day two here by Mark Anderson. Yesterday we did the commons and uncommons. Today we're doing the rares and mythics. So if you have not checked out the rares, or sorry, if you haven't checked out the commons or uncommons just yet, they are on the Limited Level Ups podcast feed, also on the Limited Level Ups YouTube channel, also on Twitch VODs if you want to check it out there. Um, but we're just going to jump right into it, Mark. Uh, today's review, the rares and the mythics, often there are more Fs and more As. And definitely for this set, actually, I think there's a lot of Fs. We're going we're gonna to actually skip through a lot of the cards. A lot of them have like weird, they're weird commander cards or cards that have constructed applications that... Uh, not really going to apply to us. And something you noted too, not a ton of just like straight up A, A plus level cards, right? Yeah, I'm I'm excited for this, partly because like I, I looked at the rares and mythics this morning just to give a, a little bit of extra prep for this. And like the, the lower power level actually made me more excited for the set. Mm -hmm. Quickly, when I look at the comments and uncommons, I'm like, you know, the, the gears are turning in my head. And then you start looking at some of the rares and you're like, okay, yeah, this just invalidates like everything I was thinking about. <laughs> And that's not going to happen here. I think a lot of these are at, like a pretty sweet spot power wise, where like the bad ones are bad, but the good ones are interesting instead of just being broken. So I'm excited. Definitely. So we're just going to jump right into it. We're going in Wooberg color order. We're going to have artifacts and gold cards at the end today. We're starting with white, and our first card here is Frodo Sauron's Bane. So Frodo is a single white mana legendary creature halfling at rare. It's a one two, and it's got two abilities. The first ability. Hybrid Orzhov, Hybrid Orzhov, so two mana, either any combo of black and white. If Frodo Sauron's Bane is a citizen, it becomes a halfling scout with base power and toughness 2, 3, and lifelink. It's also got the second ability here, black, black, black. If Frodo is a scout, it becomes a halfling rogue with whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, that player loses the game if the ring has tempted you four or more times this turn. Otherwise, the ring tempts you, and that if you have been tempted four or more times, that's counting you. That's talking about you, that's not talking about the opponent. I first read this card, I'm like, oh, that's the downside of getting tempted. If Frodo hits you, you lose, but no, it's just, it's all upside, um, as is part for the course here. So we've got one of these kind of level up style one drops that we've seen a lot of in the past little while. What do you think of Frodo? Uh, these level up cards are usually pretty good if you can, like, pay for them. This mm -hmm. one, a little less so. Like, you know, one mana, one, two is fine. Three mana, two, three lifelink is fine. That last ability, not only is it like pretty hard to activate, it's also, I don't think going to be, it's basically just like triple black to have the ring tempt you, which is only going to like move around your your ring bear potentially. I, I'm not sure. Like by the time you've played this and used it and leveled up four times, I think your opponent's going to be low enough that hitting them for the damage plus the extra three from, from the top level of the ring is gonna come close to killing them anyway so right <laughs> I, I don't know if that's that important but the card's fine yeah so let's just evaluate it as if this was just in a white deck like white and then white for a one one and then white white to level up to a two three how do, how do you like that yeah it's like uh like a c c plus card like it's fine yeah and then to the odds you know if you do have the black system the black mana gets a little bit better but i would just give frodo a c plus yeah i think i'm there too all right cool uh, next up, we've got ooh, kind of a cool one. Flowering of the White Tree. So this is white, white, two mana for a legendary enchantment at rare. It says legendary creatures you control get plus two, plus one, and have ward one. And non-legendary creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So a two mana anthem and better, even better for your legends. Yeah, this card is great if the casting cost is like easy for your deck. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a card you don't really care to play on turn two, right? Like... You normally want to play a few creatures first, unless you don't have a two drop in hand. And then you'll play this like after you've got a little bit of board presence. But this is like pretty undercosted. Even even like as a three man anthem, I think this would be decent. Yeah, definitely. Just uh, that that additional buff to your legends. Remember, uh, you know, we talked about this a lot yesterday, but you're gonna have very often at least a legend and off you know, sometimes two or three on the battlefield. There's a lot of legends in the set, the ring gives you a legend. I would generally give a Glorious Anthem effect, like a three-mana version of this, you know, around a B. I think this goes into the... could be A- minus range. What do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's, let's... I mean, it, the, a mass isn't going to give you multiple bodies for right. this. But, um, like, it's... I think you're going to be playing a lot of creatures, not a lot of great removal in this set. I could see boards going pretty wide. 
and it can just like end the game for for two mana so uh i'm, I'm gonna go b plus on this cool yeah i'll stick with my a minus and uh cool. what do we have next next we have dawn of a new age which is one and a white for a mythic enchantment when it enter it enters the battlefield with a hope counter on it for each creature you control at the beginning of your end step remove a hope counter from dawn of a new age if you do draw a card then if it has no hope counters on it sacrifice it and gain four life Hmm. Yeah, so I was kind of evaluating this as, let's just imagine you have two creatures in the battlefield and you cast it. And that's on the low end, of course. You're you're spending two mana for a delayed draw two and then gain four life. That's not too bad. Uh, It, gets, it goes up from there. I, I think go back on and forth in this card because the thing is, you know, there was a card kind of similar yesterday. We had the, it was a blue instant that it, whenever you scryed, it, like blue instant, one in a blue, draw a card, and when you scry, you can flash it back into the yard for free. This is sort of similar to that. So what's your read on the card? Yeah, I think this card's like not great, but I, I don't think it's enough. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say somewhere in like uh, D plus C minus range. <laughs> like, I, I don't think you're going to want this in a lot of spots, but there, there's going to be the odd spot for it. So I think I'll just give it a D plus. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and that sounds probably lower than a lot of people might have. And I know a lot of people were kind of hyping this card up. Uh, and the thing is, it's just pretty slow it your white decks aren't gonna like to take advantage of the this you know it's, it's a function of time basically in your white decks how many turns are gonna their game's gonna go ideally you know six seven eight uh and this if you cast it on turn two or sorry turn four with it with a two drop maybe you get two or three counters but it's also a really really bad top deck so yeah i'm gonna start low on this i think d is about right but i, I could see, certainly see this going uh, a different way yeah, I mean, the nice thing is you don't have to pump any more mana into it. It doesn't, like, lose you life. Uh, and then that, that four life you gain at the end is is a nice bonus, yeah. too. Like, you almost... There's going to be some games where you want this to do less than... Like, you know, if you have, like, four creatures, you're going to wish this was for two because you could gain the life earlier. Mm -hmm. But, um, it, yeah, it's, it's just a nice reservoir of cards. Only two mana. I, I think D-plus is fair. Cool. Uh, next up, we've got the Battle of Bywater. This is one white-white for a sorcery at rare. It says, destroy all creatures with power three or greater. Then you create a food token for each creature you control. Yeah, this one's really interesting. Yeah. Because, um, so, you, obviously, if your deck doesn't have any power three or greater creatures, it's going to be really good. Mm -hmm. If you do, it's kind of awkward whether you, like, play around this when you don't have it in hand or when you do. But even if you're, like, not killing anything on either side if you're making like four or five food tokens it, it might still be okay yeah <laughs> like that that the food tokens alone almost break the parody a little bit right like not fully of course you're not you wouldn't be that happy if it was like sack two your big two big things sack their two big things make some food and it's gonna be worse than that sometimes but if this is you know one of the ways you can make a sweeper not symmetrical of course is try to well, try to make it not symmetrical. Try to have it not hit your things. There's cards that, like, farewell that very easily are just like, all right, exile all the enchantments, and I keep all my artifacts, and that's why cards like that are kind of busted. And this card has a little bit of that, but it's harder to control. So I think most of the white decks are going to have this be a pretty good card. Like, I think there's going to be times when it's just the straight up, I keep my stuff, kill your stuff. There's also going to be times it's a little bit awkward, because you do just have, like, you know, two or three, three power creatures. So... I think it's kind of a build around grade. If you take this early, you do kind of want to lean towards a lower curve. And if you pick it up later, it's probably going to be fine too. So I'm going to say build around B on Battle of Bywater. Yeah, that, that sounds fair. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's a, it, what kind of deck does this go on? Do you think this is in, in like an aggressive deck, a controlling deck, somewhere in between? Yeah, I think it's probably okay in your more aggressive decks. Just like, you know, you you play your two, and that's going to be a two-power thing. You pay your th play your three. A lot of times, that's a two-power thing. The game goes on for a little bit. Maybe you just get a two-for-one off of this. And again, like, I don't want to discount making the food. Like, that that is a real deal for just, you know, you make two food, make three food. Um, So, like, so, sometimes you're not always going to do this, and I think it's rare you're going to do this, but sometimes you're going to go cast this, don't kill anything, make five food or something like that, right? So that's the mode of the card, too. So I think it's going to be good in most decks because the aggressive decks will just be fine playing this card i believe and i think the slower decks can kind of have some time building around it or holding your wings of the cosmos to pump your opponents <laughs> does, the wings, does wings even target enemy creatures i don't even know i think but... so i feel like it does yeah 
yeah for some some pump spells i'm sure you can and then and yeah. then you can get kind of cute with this thing cool too so yeah this, this card i think is really interesting and it's probably one we're gonna talk about more than the others for sure this is one where like if you get it pick one pack one you have a pretty clear direction of what you want to do but like if you get it like pack three you got to kind of figure out whether you're going to either make some deck building concessions or whether you're going to make some gameplay concessions yes for it. definitely and that's tricky so Definitely one that's a little bit tricky, but I'll stick with uh, build around B, and you're somewhere the same about. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just join you on that one. That that sounds fair to me. Cool. What's up next? Next we have Boromir, Warden of the Tower, two and a white for a three three legendary human soldier at rare. He has vigilance. Whenever opponent casts a spell, if no mana was spent to cast it, counter that spell, and you can sacrifice him to give your creatures indestructible until end of turn and have the ring tempt you. I think that middle line pretty much doesn't matter. There's maybe one or two cards at in the rare mythics that we're gonna get to today that that will come up once in a while. But basically, that's constructed text. So three three vigilance legend that sacrifices to save your team and the ring tempts you. That's just a solid card. Yeah, worth noting it doesn't stop that um, that draw spell that like gets cast for free from your graveyard when you scry. Mm. Good um, ability, just, right? Uh, I think it's like yeah, 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 exactly. So, so that that might be like the spot where people say, "Oh, that's going to work," but yeah, that's that's not going to be the case. And then this is also our first uh, three mana creature that doesn't get hit by that one mana counter spell, right? <laughs> that's true. Yeah, the the uh, stern scolding that counter a uh, creature with. Wait, no, it does. It's oh no, two, two. You're right. It doesn't have two uh, power or toughness. So yeah, cool. Okay, so yeah, it's not a over the top super flashy rare, but it's it's a solid. One. I think I would just give Boromir a B. Yeah, I was thinking B plus for this. I think it has a lot of like like the the first and Little third things. lines are, are pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Even yeah. Something having the ring tempt you, just a lot of flex like it's free. Yep. Yeah, I'll join you there. I'll join you at B plus for Boromir. Okay. Next up, uh, I think we have our first F here. Forge in you is his two and a white variant shaman at rare. When it enters the battlefield, you return an equipment from your graveyard to the battlefield. As long as it's your turn, you can activate equip uh, abilities anytime you can cast an instant. And you can pay zero rather than pay for equip costs for the first equip ability you activate during each of your turns. No, just straight up, we're not going to have enough equipment. And it's just not big, uh, high enough impact. You want to be doing this with something that's, you know, gigantic in uh, Constructed, but not for Limited. So just an F for Forging You. Yeah, no arguments there. Next is a little bit interesting. War of the Last Alliance. This is a rare saga. Three and a white. First two chapters are the same. Search your library for a legendary creature, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. Then the third chapter is creatures you control gain double strike until end of turn, and the ring tempts you. Yeah, like if in any other set, this card would just be... I could see this being printed in other sets as like, oh, this is a thing for commander players yeah. to do and, and being terrible. But I think it's actually not bad here. No, definitely. Yeah. Like so searching for a legendary creature is is sometimes just going to feel like you're casting two demonic tutors right, right. <laughs> those are the best things you want to get in, in your deck exactly and then double strike is no joke like you, if you've given yourself two cards to play to add to the board and then that's probably going to end the game on the third chapter yeah i think this card is actually pretty good so you are you know you, you're taking turn four off quote unquote but then drawing two very good cards and then like you said that third chapter and the ring, ring tempting you it's like nice little icing on the cake there um i think the war of the last alliance is hmm I kind of just want to give this a B, honestly. Like, it's, it's obviously... You're going to want to have three, four legends in your deck so that you don't draw them in your opening hand and this does nothing. But I don't think that's going to be very hard. And this said, I think most decks are going to have around three or four legends. So the deck building fulfillment, it's not that hard to do. And if you're if you're there, it's just good. So I don't know. I think I think B for War of Last Alliance. I'm going to go higher. I'm going to go B+. Plus. Okay, I, yeah. I, I think it's a good card. Yeah, definitely a card that, like you said, I think if, if you're not thinking critically about this set, it might just look like a commander card, but uh, I think it's better than that. All right, what do we have next here? Next is Gandalf the White. Three white white for a legendary avatar wizard. He is a 4-5 with flash. You may cast legendary spells and artifact spells as though they had flash. And if a legendary permanent or an artifact entering or leaving the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger that ability triggers an additional time <laughs> a real mouthful there yeah they really like putting this panharmonic on ability on uh, flashy cards now so we've got a five mana four or five flash that's gonna eat some stuff a good amount of the time right and five toughness is enough that you can pretty safely block like a two two and then gandalf won't die to a trick or anything you can even block something bigger if you don't mind this getting eaten or just, you know, creating off in combat or losing to a trick. And then that 
important flashy line of text here. A legendary permanent or uh, a legendary permanent or an artifact entering or leaving. That one's kind of interesting. So there are the uh, the artifacts we saw, Lumbass, that uh, will trigger twice. So just you know, just off the top of my head, that draws you two cards. And just any you of the... Have to it twice? Sorry, say again? You also have to shuffle it twice? Yeah, I guess, I guess you do. Yeah, you have to shuffle your library twice because when it leaves, too. Um, I'm sure there's, like, a bunch of things just scattered throughout the set. Like, there's a few artifacts we mentioned. A lot of the uncommon legends that we talked about yesterday were, like, when a human enters the battlefield. And that, that'll trigger multiple times. Huh. Yeah, I, I think just the base rate of 4 or 5 flash with a bit of upside sprinkled in. I remember, actually, I think we underrated, or maybe I underrated, uh, Elish Norn, uh, the... 4 7 version from one where i was like oh, okay there's not that many etb effects and there was just like there weren't that many in one but there were enough to make that card really really good and this doesn't shut okay. off your opponent's abilities but i don't know yeah i got i got i gotta stop you for a second yeah. there because this is worded like i had to read this a couple times okay so if you have the two three human that whenever human enters the battlefield it gives a creature double strike yes um that is not going to trigger this because it's not the legendary permanent entering the battlefield. It's the human token entering the battlefield. Sure, sure. Whereas, that's true. Yeah, yeah. It's not just any ETBs. Yeah. If you have a legendary creature that enters that causes a non-legendary permanent to trigger, you're going <laughs> to get two of those. Right. Yes. That's, yeah, that, that is good Good clarification there. That is true. I think I, yeah, yeah, I got a little carried away. Like, when, when, an enter, when a legendary thing enters, something happens. And so that that's always going to gonna trigger but yeah it also chat also mentions that food gives you six life with this um although no that's not that's not a trigger no no, no that's so not a triggered ability when it leaves that's just the, the ability of sacking the food yeah true. food doesn't okay. food doesn't get you six. That, 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 I, first time i've referenced them and and i've been thrown astray so <laughs> led astray by chat as always yeah, yeah. so i do think this card's good though yeah yeah we've been kind of like keeping it hawing a little bit here and there talking to the card but if you were to stamp a grade on gandalf what would you give it uh I think I can give my first A. I'll give an A minus for yeah, this. Yeah, that's what I was going to do too. I think just it stands to quote unquote draw you a card when it enters by eating something and then it's upside from there. So, and you know, worth noting too, giving your legendary spell a slash, like don't don't look that over. It's you know, a lot of time you're, you're just going to pass the turn after you cast Gandalf and your opponent's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, right? You just flash in like your 4-4 four, four or something. So yeah, let's give A minus to Gandalf. I, I do think it's like, it's less likely to eat something against a decent player because there's actually quite mm -hmm. a few flash creatures in this set yeah fair like there, there's a blue gandalf that's a two four with flash there's the two two flyer that gives like a creature plus two plus oh so there's there's like a number of of different flash creatures i think and so like an astute player if you're leaving up four or five mana on a combat step like the alarm bells are going to go off yes but I, I still think it's quite a good card yeah me too and that brings us to blue so our first blue here blue card is born upon the wind one in a blue for an instant at rare you may cast spells this turn as though they had flash draw a card yeah uh so this is another uh, another example of where you might think oh we're gonna get to ambush something because we can play this then we can cast an instant speed creature and like i just mentioned with gandalf i think like people are gonna kind of be able to tell what's up in some cases yep um so if this isn't getting like that mid combat blowout or something like that it's not that exciting like it really is a lot closer to just two mana draw card than the first line of text might allow you to believe um so I i'm not like that high on this card yeah i think this one is like you know if, if you have you're playing the spells deck it's just like you want a cantrip it's not the best cantrip because it's not very efficient it's not giving you a card selection but like it has a little bit of upside like i can see this you would play this in a spells deck some amount of the time but it's it's not a card you're just gonna play in every one of your blue decks i think it's mostly just a d you, oh really I, I like it more than that oh yeah okay so yeah like, say, like a c just the fact that you can leave mana up for this and, and like do anything like it's it's still nice i just you know the, the best case scenario of like oh i leave my mana up and then my opponent attacks with a three three and i instant cast a four four and play that like that's the best case scenario but if you just have like a couple of sorceries in hand then you can just leave up your mana and hold up counter spells and hold up like your opponent has to play around everything I still think this card's going to make the cut most of the time. Yeah, you're so, like you just think you're going to play this in most of your blue decks just this is your somewhere between your 16th and 23th playable, you think? Yeah, I have it like C C+ plus range. -ish. All right. Yeah, I I'll I'll come up a little bit. I'll go C- minus on it. I I just think there's a lot of wheel spinny stuff in blue and I don't know if you're going to have room for this is all. Like I think a lot of the other cantrips we saw yesterday 
are arguably better, but I might be, be surprised for this one. So, yeah, a little bit of a diversion grade there. Next up, we've got Goldberry, River Daughter. This is one and a blue for a 1-3 Legendary Creature Rare. Has tap, move a counter of each kind not on Goldberry from another target permanent you control onto Goldberry. And a second ability, blue tap, move one or more counters from Goldberry onto target permanent you control if you do draw a card. That's a lot of words. So basically, she can steal a counter, plus one counter, and put it on herself. And then you can move it back to something else. And if you do all that, you know, song and dance, you get to draw a card off of it. So, cheap legend. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, you know, go ahead. I was going to say, I was just going to say cheap legend, but it, it's not that, not that many awesome applications. There's a lot, like, you can do cute stuff with, like, sagas with this, too. And, mm, like, true. Just... Okay. And I do think moving, like, moving the plus one one counter to Goldberry first makes a 2-4, which is, like, pretty good. But then the ability, like, that second line of text is instant speed, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You can throw that plus one plus one counter onto any creature and, and draw a card. And then, like, you're going to mess up your opponent's attacks. And then if they don't attack, you just do it and then flip it back again. So I, I kind of like this thing. I think it's pretty good. Yeah, and blue, for what it's worth, uh, you're getting your amass tokens in blue, a decent amount. So that's that's mostly where your plus one plus one counters are going to come from, or your counters in general. Um, yeah, I, I think I was I was lower on this going in, but I think you're right. I think it's actually a little bit better than that. It can do some tricksy things. It's not that like slowish opportunity cost. We were just talking about how one three in this set is going to probably overperform a little bit because being tempted by the ring. Once you have high power, low toughness, we were talking about that yesterday. So yeah, I I agree. It's it's a nice little. I don't want to call it a value card, but a utility card. So, I don't know. You want to give, like, a C to Goldberry? C plus? Yeah. Like, on the condition that you have stuff with counters on them, because you, you do need the abilities to be relevant. To, right. Not to do, like, a 1-3. But, like, especially if you're playing, like, blue-black, I think black's going to have, like, tons of amass cards where you always have a counter to move around. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be pretty, pretty good there. So, I don't want to give it a, a different rating based on color pairs. But, yeah, my gut says, like, yeah, like C plus for this thing too. Yeah, cool. Let's go C plus for Goldberry. And uh, what do we have next? Next, we have Lost Isle Calling. One in a blue for an enchantment. Whenever you scry, put a verse counter on Lost Isle Calling. Pay four blue, blue, and exile Lost Isle Calling. Draw a card for each verse counter on it. Then, if it adds seven more verse counters on it, take an extra turn after this one. Activate only as a sorcery, and I think we can go through this one pretty quickly with enough. Yeah, it's just it's just gonna take way too much to like if you're if you're paying eight mana, and let's say you're drawing three or four, that's not a good deal. And even like like you're basically you're gonna be winning if you're getting that seven. So you're like already winning, I don't think that's gonna be you, you shouldn't account for that. Uh, so yeah, let's just give F two Lost Isle Calling. Yeah, you don't need to talk about it. It, it does nothing until you sacrifice it. It's, yeah. it's just horrible and yeah. terrible top deck too. Uh, next up, we've got Scroll of Isildur. This is a, another saga. Three to blue for a rare saga. Chapter one, gain control of up to one target artifact for as long as you control the Scroll of Isildur. The ring tempts you. Chapter two, tap up to two target creatures, put a stun counter on each of them. And then chapter three, you draw a card for each tapped creature target opponent controls. Yeah, so um, I initially when you know we went back to yesterday when i first thought the ring was an artifact i thought this thing was great uh the fact that it's an emblem makes <laughs> this a little worse yeah but i do think there's going to be a decent number of spots where you can nab like potentially a food token if, if they don't have an equipment to get mm -hmm. um and if if this is getting a food token like most of the time i think i'm okay playing it yeah i think like it's almost you kind of look at the second and the third chapter and almost think of this as like suspend one turn you get that i mean obviously you know sagas have some analogs to suspend in general but i'm basically looking at this as i don't think the first chapter necessarily matters like if you're just playing this as tap two things and then drawing two cards and potentially three three because on that second turn when the second chapter goes off or sorry in anticipation of the third chapter your opponent's not going to want to attack you that turn or yep. you know that's a cost to attack so you because you then you maybe would draw another card so I think just like tap two things, they they lock down for a turn and draw two. Like that's a pretty good deal for your three mana, even over time. Well, if if you're not getting anything on the first chapter, I don't think it. Like if you're never getting anything on the first chapter, I think it's a bad card. Really, I don't feel that way. I, I think it would just be fine. Like I think if you just it just said like something completely irrelevant, it wouldn't be that bad as long as it had the ring tempsy, which it does. That's oh, that's that's true. I, I glossed over the fact that chapter one, you're still getting the ring tempting you. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, okay. So what, what do you want to give this then? I was going to be pretty high on this. I was just going to give it a B. A B? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to go C plus and we'll, we'll get a... <laughs> Ch- chat I'll saying uh, fixed invasion of Kamigawa. I think it's quite a bit better than that. It's cheaper. You're tapping two things. You're drawing some cards off of it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm going to stay with my grade. Sorry, what did you, I, I, I cut you off there. What we go grade for you? I'm giving it a C plus. Okay, cool. And, and just so chat knows, anytime we have a difference of at least two... Uh, microgrades I, I highlighted in our sheet so that means this will be one of the the highlighted cards nice uh next up we've got press the enemy this is two blue blue for an instant at rare return target spell or non-land permanent and opponent controls to its owner's hand you may cast an instant or sorcery spell with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost yeah this is like an almost f i, I would say i don't know if you're there or not but like there's not like if you're casting a three drop off of this, then you're basically playing like a one mana bounce spell, which is good but not great, but has this like awkward you can you can't actually just do it for one mana. Mm-hmm. And that's like the best case scenario on this. So I don't think this card's very good. Yeah, it's I th- I think you you kind of touched on the way to frame it. It's it, you get a run mana bounce spell or, or bounce permanent or spell. For one mana and that would be good but that is only if you are casting that three drop and sometimes there's a three drop where like you don't want to cast it like it's a removal spell you don't really want to cast it or you know it's just there's times when this it's not going to line up the way you want it to so this the ceiling of the card is fine but the floor of the card is quite bad to clarify this I, I i i used to know all this stuff but i feel like i'm i'm second second guessing myself here yeah the equal or lesser mana value is based on the CMC of four, not the thing you're bouncing, right? Uh, you return it. You may cast a instant sorcerer with equal. Uh, no, the, the spell you you bounce. So if you, okay, so yeah. So I, I thought you were just using four as an, as a baseline. Okay, but if you bounce a six drop, you can play something that costs five. Yes, it's not based on this. Yes, that's right. But the thing is, there's like hardly any expensive cards in this set. Right. So that, that actually maybe makes this worse rather than better. Yeah, when you were saying four mana, and I was saying three mana as a thing you put into play or get, get to cast. I thought you were just saying like on average or a card you could nab in the mid game um okay so yeah i think this card's not very good i would i would give this a yeah yeah. Yeah, d minus yeah minus okay d minus for press the enemy all right what's up next next we have rangers of ethelion two blue blue for a three three human ranger has vigilance and when it enters the battlefield gain control of up to one target creature with lesser power for as long as you control rangers of ethelion then the ring tempts you wow yeah, this card's good. Like we we've seen uh kind of similar cards to this that have been able to take anything, and those cards have been really really good. There was like Mind Flayer from AFR. This is cheaper and has a restriction, but the Ring Tempting You is cool. Vigilance is kind of funny because you're not often gonna get into combat with this thing, but it doesn't matter that much. It's kind of just gravy. So yeah, this card's just good. You cast in four, you steal something. Your opponent's gonna have to scramble to get it back often. Um, yeah, I just want to give this like an A minus. Yeah. And, but and there is also a number of ways to sacrifice things that you've stolen. So yep. you might be able to start brawling with this if you're able to get rid of the, the thing you've taken. Yeah, the classic blue black steel and sack deck. And again, don't uh, look over the ring temps. That's no matter even if it just gets picked off right away, you're still getting a, a slight bit of value. Yep. Next up, we got the Watcher in the Water. This is three blue blue for a mythic legendary creature, Kraken. It's a nine nine, and it says it enters the battlefield with. Uh, nine stun counters on it tapped. <laughs> so, you know, nine, nine turns were untapped. But whenever you draw a card during an opponent's turn, you create a 1-1 one, one blue tentacle creature token. And whenever a tentacle you control dies, untap up to one target Kraken and put a stun counter on up to one target non-land permanent. So the idea here is you're going to draw cards in your opponent's turn, or at least ostensibly, and the Kraken tokens die, or you get Kraken tokens and they die, and this will untap sooner. This is another one that feels like it's like almost F, but not quite. So yeah. <laughs> like D, D minus. Like if you're if you're if you have enough instant speed draw spells, I think I'd play it. But that's like the stars aligning, and that's the only time I'd ever want to play it. Yeah, I think this is like a pretty decent draw two cards payoff. If this was just whenever you draw your second card on a turn, but having a draw on your opponent's turn that makes it so that the ring's second ability of looting you know, it won't trigger this. And so many things we talked about yesterday about the draw two uh, trigger. Just don't count for this. So 
I I think you're just it's gonna be really really difficult to have enough stuff that's gonna trigger this consistently. So I honestly just want to give it an F. I I think it's just you're just not gonna ever put this card in your deck. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a little hesitation yeah, there. I'm holding you to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you're holding me to it, and then you're gonna scan me to the screen shot. Or even better, I'll put it in my deck, and you'll be like, well, "See, I told you." <laughs> All right. Next one here, Storm of Soramon. So this is another mythic. It's a four blue blue enchantment. It's got Ward three. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, you copy it. Except the copy isn't legendary, and you can choose new targets for the copy. Yeah, this is kind of the same. Like it's like it's bad, but not totally unplayable. Like it's another like D range card for me. I think. Yeah, we like, could be really good, but it's so slow. We've seen a lot of these six mana mythics that like look to be a lot of value and end up not generally being very good. Like arcane bombardment from Streets of New Capenna. Um, there was that that Legion White enchantment from Baldur's Gate that uh, gave all your creatures double team or whatever that was. That when you know, you all, whenever you attack, you get a copy of that in your hand. Like they read pretty well, but. Especially with a card like this, then the the thing you have to get over the hump of is casting a second spell, and that's not impossible in your blue decks once you get to six mana, because you're going to have more spells, but it's not trivial as well. So, I think I'm mostly out on the card. Yeah, I think it, it looks, it aspires to be a lot and be really cool, but I think often it just pans out to be a little too many hoops to jump through. I'm, I'm giving it another D minus. Yep, I'll join you there. I like it okay. a little better than the, uh, a little better than the Kraken. <laughs> and that brings us to black, so that's our first black card. Yeah, the first black card is Call of the Ring, one and a black for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, the ring tempts you, and whenever you choose a creature as your ring bearer, you may pay two life. If you do, draw a card. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're going to get to the last ability on the ring quite quickly. Two life for a card is a lot. Like, yes. one life is, you know, that ends up, we were talking about that yesterday, but two is is substantial. So well, you're one, not just going to card is is a lot two life for a card is, is astronomical yes <laughs> like, like i don't i don't want to discount that so basically i think you can draw a card off this once maybe twice if, if the game is in a state where it's like okay i'm not getting pressured we are we are in a bit of a grind maybe even three or four times i think most of the time though you're only going to be able to pay two once to be able to recoup this card back so it's sort of like a slow, you'll eventually get the last ability of the ring that can trips and cost you two life, but then in a grindy game, maybe it draws you more cards. Yeah, I've, I've got this as just another, like, D minus. Like, so many of these, like, almost unplayable, but I, I can see a, a rare situation where it's it can be good. Yeah, I guess one of the kind of interesting things, it, it, it's kind of secretly modal, too, because another thing you can look at this as is just you get to choose a new ring bearer every single turn. And that has some value in it, especially cards that we've seen a few yesterday that care about when you choose ring bearer. Like there's the Gandalf card that whenever you chose a ring bearer, you drew a card. So maybe there's a little bit of something there where if you have enough cards that care about you choosing a ring bearer, uh, it goes up a little bit. But I do think most decks aren't going to love this. Yeah, like it does nothing the turn it comes down, mm -hmm. right? Like it's... Yeah. A top deck, and then also, if you don't have a creature out, you also don't have the option to draw a card. Right, yeah, totally. Yeah, let's go D for Call of the Ring, and it gets a little bit better if you have the cards that care about this kind of stuff. Sure. Next up, ooh, a Constructed All-Star here. Orcish Bowmasters, one in a black for a 1-1 Orc Archer at rare. It's got Flash, and it says when Orcish Bowmasters enters the battlefield, and whenever an opponent draws a card except for the first one they drew in each of their draw steps... Orgish Bowmaster deals one damage to any target, and then you amass one. Oof. This card is fantastic. Like, yeah. there's so much draw going on in this set with the looting from the ring and, and like, the draw two things. And e even if it, like, didn't trigger an additional time, it's got 1-1 one, one flash, ping one, amass one. Like, that's already a that's great That's great, card. yeah. <laughs> I think this is just an A. Yeah, I think this is an A, too. Just the, the times, just imagine the times your opponent plays a 2-1, you untap and play this. You've got a kind of a, uh, you know, raise the alarm, plus you kill their thing, and then it just stands to get better from there. Yeah, this card's so efficient, so fantastic. Just A for Orgish Bowmasters. Three X ones on its own. Right, yeah, man, yeah. And it really limits what your opponent can do. And I think the ring, uh, the second ability is an optional trigger. I don't think you need to draw when you, uh, for, for that second ability, you're not forced to, so it's not like you're, <laughs> this is like a, a ring hoser or something, but it's, even still, it makes it so that ability, your opponent's not going to want to actually loot with it. So yeah, A for Orcish Bowmasters. Awesome. Yep. Next up, we've got Lobelia, Sackville Baggins. This is two and a black for a legendary creature, Halfling Citizen at rare. 
It's a 2-3 Flash Menace, and says, when Lobelia enters the battlefield, exile target creature from an opponent's graveyard that was put there from the battlefield this turn, then create X treasure tokens where X is the exiled card's power. Yeah, another Flash creature. So yeah, there are quite, quite a few of them in this set. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I because there's so many of them kind of diminishing returns, I think it's going to be hard to, to eat things with this. Um, and it's also, like, if you're leaving mana open and attacking in, your opponent's less likely to want to, like, make a trade because you're representing, like, combat tricks, right? Right. So, so they're already disincentivized to trade, and, and trades is what you really want to happen with this card because you need something to go to your opponent's graveyard in order to get any treasures out of this. So I think this probably reads a little better than it plays. Um, so I'm not, like, super high on uh, on Lobelia. Yeah, me too. I think often, just like we talk about how death triggers are a little bit harder to trigger than people might think, you can imagine the times it's like, okay, I'm just going to pass the turn, a trade's going to happen, I'm going to get some treasure. It, it doesn't often work out like that. That said, you know, end of the day, you just, like, you know, if nothing happens, you flash in your 2-3 menace. That's not the worst thing in the world, but it's... Even when you do get the thing, like, it's it's often, like, you do get to exile something that died this turn. The upside isn't, like, gigantic. I mean, sure, making three or four treasures is kind of nice, or two or three most likely. It makes this free, essentially, but it's not a huge upside. So I'm going to go C+, plus, I think, for Lobelia, but it's not, uh, you know, not, not super over the top. Yeah, that's what I wrote down for myself as well. One thing, uh, Chad did correct this, the looting ability on the ring actually is not optional. So, uh, <laughs> Orogris Bowmaster is even better. <laughs> it's kind of yeah, cool. Yeah. All right, what do we have next? Okay. Next, we have Isildur's Fateful Strike. Two black black for a legendary instant. I think it's the only legendary instant yep. or sorcery in the whole set. I believe so. Um, you can cast this only if you control a legendary creature or a planeswalker. You destroy target creature. If its controller has more than four cards in hand, they exile cards from their hand equal to the difference. Yeah, for those who haven't played with legendary sorceries or spells before, you can only cast this if you have a legend on the battlefield, which, like we mentioned, that's that's not going to be that hard. The last time we saw legendary instance of sorceries was original Dominaria, and the baseline was like, you want to have at least three or four legends in your deck to reliably not just have these stuck in your hand, closer to four more, most likely, and I think you're just going to have more in this. I'd say you're going to have something close to like nine or 10 when you're counting the tempting by the rings, uh, you know, as legendary creatures. So this isn't going to be too prohibitive. I actually think like decks might even have more than that. Yeah, totally. Like, I, I can see that. Commons are all, and rares are all legends. And those are the cards you want to be casting. Like, it's not like this is a, a common driven set that we've seen. So I, I could see like decks having up to like, 12, 15 legends in, in some in some cases, and that's without even counting all of the the tempting of the ring, right? Yeah, so I, I think it's gonna be very easy to cast. Like even on turn four, I think you'd be able to cast this a decent amount of the time. Mm -hmm. And if you cast this on turn four, it can be backbreaking. Yeah, imagine they're on the draw, so they have an additional card too. Man, that's like you're gonna get you're gonna nab a card or two, and just like kill a thing, make them discard two cards. Like that that the ceiling of that card is fantastic. So. Yeah, I, I really like this card. I just give it an A minus. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna go that high, because um, it is it is a lot of times. By the time you cast this, I think most of the time they won't have more than four cards in hand. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a slightly conditional two black black destroy target creature instant, um, and that's definitely not like an A level card for me. Sure, so I agree. Me, you really need to be hitting at least one card in hand most of the time. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna give it a B. Okay, yeah, no, 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 I, I agree. It's, it's just going to be four mana kill thing some of the time, and that's fine still. So yeah, B sounds good. So I've, I've talked you down, no, no more A minus for you? Yeah, yeah, you talked me down a little bit. Okay. All right, next up we've got one ring to rule them all. It's a, it's a saga, two black black for a saga, and uh, it's at rare. First chapter, the ring tempts you, then each player mills cards equal to your ring bearer's power. Chapter two, destroy all non-legendary creatures. Chapter three, each opponent loses one life for each creature card in that player's graveyard. Yeah, like, all, all the sagas in this set all seem, like, tricky to evaluate. Like, yeah. slightly on the, weak, on the weaker side. Yeah, there's a spread we've, we've seen sagas be so good and limited for so long. Yep. That I think, like, this is the first time where you're like, okay, how awkward do they have to make these sagas for it to be un unplayable? And, and I'm really not sure with this card. Yeah, a lot of the sagas seem like they have one really good chapter, and then two, they're like, oh, that, that might be good. I'm actually not really sure. So let's just do the, you know, then a... a baseline just walk through this four mana you cast it and you get attempt okay that's not fantastic and both players mill that's going to be relevant for the third chapter 
Destroy all non-legendary creatures, that's not necessarily going to be upside for you. It could be. You know, Great. definitely don't well, count. The ring tempting you makes one yes. of your non-legendary creatures a legend, so that that's nice. But you're right. Like, this could be, like, it could be a Plague Wind for you instead of your opponent, right? Like, where, where it kills all your stuff and none of your opponent's stuff. So right. it could be pretty bad. Definitely. So it's hard, it's hard to evaluate just, like, looking at the card. You have to look at your deck, basically, to say how often is that going to be more beneficial for me than the opponent. And then... You know, chapter three is nice. It's not over the top. They're gonna lose. They're gonna get dinged for a few points. Here's a tricky one. I think it like kind of like the other sagas. My gut says it's kind of bad because they can see the second chapter coming too. Like so, I I think this is like a D plus type card, but. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I was saying that it seems like on these sagas, maybe one mode is really good, and or one chapter, and that mode on this one is two, and because it's not always going to be, <laughs> it's going to be a little awkward sometimes, I think I'm on board with you with the D. Yeah, it, you're definitely going to get gotten by this card sometimes. Sometimes your opponent's going to play it, and you're just like, wow, that is really bad for me. But I also think there's going to be enough times when it just backfires or blinds up poorly or just a little more awkward than you might like it. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give a D to one ranked world them all. All right, what's up next? Next we have Sauron the Necromancer. Three black black for a 4-4 four, four legendary avatar horror. It has menace, and whenever it attacks, exile target creature card from your graveyard. Create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of that card, except it's a 3-3 three, three black wraith with menace. At the beginning of your next end, end step, exile that token, unless Sauron is your ring bearer. Hmm, okay. So it attacks for a lot. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, in, I'm interested in this. I think. Yeah, I think so. I think even if your Soren's not your ring bearer, you're pretty happy with get back a three three for the turn. Hard hard to block this thing. Plays well with tricks and removal spells. Maybe you get an ETB on your creature you're bringing back. Yeah, I I think this all adds up to a pretty good card. I don't know if I go pretty good. I, I have it as like playable. Playable, like C plus like, level or. Four four. It doesn't like do anything to make itself your your ring bearer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like you're getting just a three three menace. So I mean seven seven damage of menace is a lot. Yeah. But it yeah no come into play abilities no value. Like not great on defense again right like a four, it's a four four on defense with no other text. I, I think I have this as like a, like a B minus. Okay, yeah, that's that's what I was gonna say too. Yeah, C plus B minus area. I I think it's yeah. It all all the points you just mentioned. I I would definitely uh, second. Not that great in blocks, but yeah, it's it's a it's a solid card. Uh, yeah, the nice thing about if this is your ring bearer though, it does mean that like the fact that it has menace and that it it could be your ring bearer means that like your opponent's not going to be able to just, like, eat it, right? Like, right. you're going to have to at least trade something for it when you attack, and then you get the 3-3 three, three with Menace as well. But it does attack fairly well. Yep, definitely. And then our last black card here is Witch King of Angmar. This is 3 black black for a mythic legendary creature, Wraith Noble. This is 5-3 flyer. Whenever one or more creatures deals combat damage to you, each opponent sacrifices a creature that dealt damage to you this turn. The ring tempts you. And it has an ability, discard a card. Witch King of Angmar gains indestructible until end of turn and tap it. It's just an A? Yeah, this card's good. Yes, so good. <laughs> like, it's got a protection effect that, mind you, won't protect against all the removal spells. But it's going to win combats, or be very difficult to get into combat with because it's going to eat something for, you know, you get to trade in a card in your hand as a, as a quote-unquote free removal spell. And then if they're attacking you with multiple things, obviously that's good too because that first ability and this kills them pretty quickly. Yeah, I think you could remove like any of those three text box abilities and still have it be like a very good card. The uh, flavor win here is, of course, is the uh, the deal three, the uh, two mana deal three in red can kill this, and I think that was flavored as uh, you know part of the fellowship killing this. And I, I believe if I'm to uh, if I'm to believe what I've been told, that is part of the story where they. Spoiler alert. Yeah, Holy spoiler cow. alert, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that, that is the thing, kind of thing. It can, uh, that uh, GL3 makes the thing lose indestructible. So, yeah. Hey. That's that's a good point. It is, like, it is susceptible to some, like, there's a there's a, a white lockdown spell, but then you're still going to get the passive on this. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's a couple spells that deal with it cleanly. <laughs> chat still- chat is daggering me for for saying part of the fellowship kills this as my descriptor for what happens in the story. I, I'll take blame for that. <laughs> Not exactly uh, what happens, but yeah, sweet card. You're on. You're with me on an A. Yeah, I think yes? so. Uh, next up we've got Shadow of the Enemy, not the last black card, actually this is the last one. Three black 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 for sorcery and mythic. Exile all creature cards from target player's graveyard. You may cast spells from among those cards for as long as they remain exiled and mana of any type can be spent to cast them. Yeah, this is just just like an expensive draw spell, basically. Yeah, it's like draw all the creatures out of your opponent's grave, kind of. Yeah, which is for six mana, three of which is black. Like, I'm... This is probably going to be, on average, like a draw... On average, probably a draw three creatures. Mm-hmm. So you're, like, you're drawing three spells, which is which is nice. But I'm not that excited about this. Yeah, I don't think so either. This is another, like, yeah, not quite enough, but I'm going to give this, like, a D minus. D minus? Yeah. I'll, I'll go D plus. All right, cool. That brings us to our first red card here with Moira Marauder. Red, red for a 1-1 one, one at rare. It's a goblin. It's got double strike, and it says whenever a goblin or orc you control deals combat damage to a player, exile the top card of your library, you may play that card this turn. I, I haven't corrected a few of your little ones, but Moria. This, this one was Moria, yeah, Moria, right? Yeah, my bad. This, there's been a couple of like slight ones that I've noticed, but uh, <laughs> I don't I don't want to be I, that I guy. feel so shameful. Usually I like I said, I'm the one on top of this kind of stuff, but I'm in other shoes on the other foot this time. <laughs> but yeah, this thing already like if it just triggered off itself, it'd be okay. The fact that it, like, triggers off armies and other orcs and goblins is good. Mm-hmm. And then this is, like, an amazing uh, ring bearer to have. Yeah, worth noting, this is the uh, the kind of trigger where it's on your, your turn. It's not till the end of your next turn. You have to cast the card now. So, you know, just, just a little note there. They like to mix it up. But, yeah, like I said, very good ring bearer. Yeah, I think this card's uh, good without, like, it's not anywhere close to, like, an A-level card, I don't think. No. But, uh... Some somewhere in the B range. I, I think I just give it like a B. Yeah, I was gonna give it a B minus. It's it's just a little solid card. You know, your punk's gonna have to respect it. It plays pretty well in combat. Plays pretty well as tricks. So, yeah, cool. B minus for me. Next up, we've got spiteful banditry. This is X red red for enchantment at rare. Or sorry, mythic. When spiteful banditry enters the battlefield, it deals X damage to each creature. And whenever one or more creatures your opponent's control die, you create a treasure token. This ability triggers only once each turn. Yeah, so people are calling this the Red Meat Hook Massacre, if I'm, uh, I believe what the internet's telling me. Yeah. I don't think it's that good, <laughs> like as good as Meat Hook, but Meat Hook was insane. Yep. Um, this card, I, I don't know. I Like, you're paying three mana to deal one damage, four to deal two, five to deal three, six to deal four. It's... I... I the, the comparisons to Meathook make people sound like it's such, such an amazing card. And I just think, like, this thing is just, like, okay. Yeah, it's fine. I think, you know, Meathook did always kind of have the issue of... It wasn't just awesome all the time. Like, sometimes you were on the draw and you were one mana behind of where your opponent needed to be... Or where your opponent was and where you needed to be to kill everything that you wanted to kill. And this has that same problem. Obviously, it's still a good effect. But, you know, just doing the math here, you're paying five mana for GL3 to everything... That's pretty below rate. Usually we pay like three mana at rare for that. And you no, know, it scales, of course. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's not a flexible card, but it, you are pumping a decent amount of mana into it. And that treasure <laughs> rider is nowhere near as good as Meat Hook's passive ability. So yeah. I honestly don't want to give this one that high of a grade. I think it's just okay. I was going to say like B minus. Yeah, I was I was going to go C plus. Um, I could be convinced that it's a little bit better than that, but I just think the way the scale is not particularly particularly great so yeah I, th- I think uh those looking for this for their commander games sweet but uh it's it's just a fine card limited yeah I, i'd be lower on this if it weren't for the fact that a lot of the creatures in this set are also understated mm-hmm. so, like dealing two damage is going to kill a bunch of three drops dealing three damage is going to kill a bunch of four drops so so I, I do think it's got like a bit of a an, an extra little buffer for that and i also just to talk it up a little of it i suppose you can engineer spots where you build up your army to be like a five five then you do this for four and you have a five five leave it less play around like that's not bad if you can engineer that it's not going to be uh every game but that's a, that's a play pattern that might happen so you know i'm it's actually i'm going to join you at b minus i think too. the right opponents can also build up their army that's true yeah that's true that's true all right maybe maybe yeah i, I think i will join you at b minus though i think there's there, it's still a good enough card okay 
All right, next up, we've got Display of Power. One red red for an instant at rare. This spell cannot be copied, and it says copy any number of target instants and or sorcery spells. You may choose new targets for the copies. It's probably not enough, but I'm going to give it enough. Yeah. <laughs> these are... When you have these at two mana, they're okay. Three mana is, is a lot clunkier. I, I'm going to give it an F too. So. Okay, here Easy. we go. Let's move on. All right, okay. what's up next? Next is the fall of Care Andros. Andros? I'm not like, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce these names. <laughs> uh, Chat was just saying a second ago, why don't we get Mark to pronounce all his names? <laughs> There's a reason we've been letting you do that. Yeah, so yeah. That I'm a little bit less. Yeah, you pre you preserve your uh, your credentials. <laughs> yeah. Two and a red for an enchantment. Whenever a creature an opponent controls is dealt excess non combat damage, a mass X where X is that excess damage. And has an ability pay seven and a red to deal seven damage to target creature. What a weirdo. So yeah, slow as heck. Yeah, slow as heck. I don't think there's any, and maybe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but last last that we had like Shadow of the Source was a, which was a big deal six. I don't think there's too many red removal spells that deal large increments of damage. It's all pretty there's small. Two, a three, a four, and an X, right? Right. Yes. There's the X uncommon one. Which was the Which was the four? The four is that you sacrifice an artifact or that's true or a creature, right? And yeah. It deals four to something. So I th I think generally, you know, it's gonna come up once in a while, but not a large part of how you're evaluating the card. Really, this is like do nothing for a pretty long time and then take over the game after you stall that. Like it does take over the game if you get to eight mana. It's pretty good with Spiteful Banditry. <laughs> yeah, the last card we just looked at, that's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, you do make a oh, lot of work. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, this is another card where I'm like, I think it's bad, but I can almost see a spot where I maybe play it. So I'm, I'm just going to give it a, like a, a D minus and then move on. I think. Yeah, and, and I think just to speak a little bit to what you were saying at the beginning of the set review, I think a lot of the rares kind of are falling in that territory. And that's good. Like you're going to get these seventh, pick a lot of the time you're like ah oh, this might be actually kind of something in my deck i'm looking for and it's not gonna be these aren't cards you're gonna first pick but i think you're if you get some of these more expensive kind of build around you weird things you can make it work so yeah i'm gonna go d minus as well but uh the thing about d minuses though is often those are the card that if you do end up getting the perfect deck from building around it it's still wrong you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah for sure like build around like c minus yes right? where it's like, yeah okay, okay at least if i build around it i get a card that like i'm I'm happy with so like yeah like d minus means i'm probably going to lose to this card once in the format but i never want to play it <laughs> chat says chat says really good once you draw your 16th land <laughs> it's true you start to do it twice a turn all right next up we've got <laughs> oh, man. glowing 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 dwarf oh. emissary this is a rare three mana three three two in a red for a three three legendary creature dwarf advisor it says whenever you cast a historic spell Create a treasure token. This ability triggers only once each turn. And a reminder, uh, artifacts, legendaries, and sagas are historic. Tap, sack a treasure, goad target creatures. This is another multiplayer mechanic. Uh, it, it's not going to have too much relevance, but it says until your next turn, that creature attacks each combat of able and attacks a player other than you. In Heads up, 1v1, it just means you target a thing, that thing has to attack. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is still a good a Yeah, good it's, ability. Still, it's still a good ability sometimes. Target a small thing. Yeah, it'd be better if they were attacking someone sitting next to you, but, you know, that's not how it works. So, uh, still, as as a 1v1 card, I think this card's pretty good, especially as it's considered, like, this is overstatted for this set, being a 3-3 three, three for 3. Mm -hmm. And it's that first ability is going to trigger fairly often, too. Yeah, I do think you're going to have, you know, we talked about legendaries. You're going to have maybe, probably a Saga in most of your decks and probably an Artifact in most of your decks, too. So well, the Sagas are pretty... Mm, I don't know. I, I wouldn't go so far as saying most sure, decks are going to sure. have a saga. Yeah, but I, I think you I think you will have either a Saga or an Artifact or two in your deck. Just, you know, just to up the count by one. And so you're going to get a treasure at this, I think, at some point. That's like a C. C plus, maybe. Uh, well, it also triggers off legendary creatures. Yes, yes, exactly. Sorry, I was just I was just adding that's to... Big, yeah. yeah, that's the big, big alert. I think this is better than a C, isn't it? Like, are you ever cutting this card? Mm, no, but I'm also not super excited about it. Well, like C plus to me is like just hundred percent never cut it. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's settle them there. Yeah. I think I think C plus. I'm probably never cutting this card. That is true. Okay. okay. I, I'm gonna go up to to B minus on this. I think it's it's like it's good enough. Yeah. You're and and is that mostly because you think you're gonna trigger this a few times, or do you think that that goat ability is gonna matter more than I'm expecting it to? 
like yeah if they play this and if you play this and they kill it like whatever that's fine but like if, if you get to untap with this a lot of times you'll be able to trigger that mm -hmm. and like a, a free treasure is no joke and then if you don't have a good use for the treasure it, it like gives you potentially something that's like gonna eat something like you can just eat a creature with this um yeah any like it just it potentially gives you free cards right like it, it makes combat a nightmare for your opponent yeah for sure okay yeah i'm gonna stick with my c plus but i i agree it's a little bit better than i was reading it at first all right sure. what's next Next, we have Aomer, Marshal of Rohan. Two red red for a 4-4 legendary human knight. Aomer has haste, and whenever one or more other attacking legendary creatures you control die, untap all creatures you control, and then there's an additional combat phase that triggers only once each turn. Hmm. Okay. So, 4 minute 4-4 four, four haste. That's not bad. It's just a solid good card. That's, that's most, of the, oh, most of the time, right? Sorry, say again? Most of the time, it's just going to be a four mana four four haste because when they block, they're going to want to block this this. Right. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if this, like, say they're forced to have the other thing, like they're forced to block this and something else, you know, you're, you're still going to get that ability. But then again, like, you know, like they're they're most likely going to go after this. They get. There's not going to be a ton of situations where they are forced to block another legendary creature. They'll go, okay, I'll kill this first, take a little bit of damage. But that's still good. It does still limit the blocks that they can have. So, a four mana four four haste is probably like. I don't know, B minus, C plus level. Um, I think that probably is, I, I'd probably just give this a B minus then. Yeah, I think I'm with you on, on B minus. It's it's well statted for this set, and the, it is some upside, even though a lot of, like a lot of times, the upside might just be that this thing, like, is the thing that has to be blocked. Yes. Right? It just makes, like, you're not going to get the trigger off it, but it's going to force your opponent to be like, okay, I have to throw my 2-2 my two -two and my 3-1 in front of this to mm -hmm. trade with it instead of, like, getting a better block somewhere else yep definitely agree yep. uh next up we've got there and back again this is a rare saga three red red first chapter up to one target creature can't block for as long as you control there and back again the ring tempts you second chapter search your library for a mountain card put it onto the battlefield then shuffle third chapter create smog a legendary six six red dragon creature token with flying haste and when this creature dies create 14 treasure tokens <laughs> So this this I like more, although I still don't think it's like an A level card. No, I, agree. I think this is like a card you're you're gonna play. Yeah, I think so too. And th that last chapter, it's nice that it has haste. Like that's that's a pretty big deal. After you've yeah. like waited a little while, the first ability, yeah, it's not bad. Making something not block. It, you know, again, bring tempting you. It's very reminiscent of that blue one where we're like, okay, the first ability is like kind of small. You might get some value out of it, but then also the ring tempts you. The middle, middle ability kind of seems um, like you might read that as like, ah, oh, do I want to ramp on turn five? And it's like not going to be the most impactful. It's obviously not as good as a ramp on turn two or three, but it's still going to matter in a lot of games. Like your an additional mana here and there will still matter. Helps you double spell on the next turn. So in the other sagas, like one of the chapters has been basically like irrelevant, right? right. Yeah. And this one, all three of them are actually like pretty good. Mm -hmm. The second one is, is just a card, right? The third one's amazing. But the first ability, having the ring tempt you means you're making a, a ring bear, of course, and upgrading your, your ring emblem. And so, and then, like, if there's one creature that's holding back your ring bear from attacking, like, that's, that first chapter is going to be better than it looks, yes. I think. Yeah, I think so, too. That's true. Yeah, with the ring bear, that, that's a really good, great point. Hmm. Okay, I, I liked this card. I think I like it even more a little bit now. I think I would just give a B to there and back again. Yeah, I was in the B, B plus range. I think I'm going to join you on a B. Okay, cool. Uh, next up, we've got another quick one. Hugh the Entwood. Three red red for a mythic sorcery. Sacrifice any number of lands. Reveal the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of lands sacrificed this way. Choose any number of artifacts and or land cards revealed this way. Put all non-land cards chosen this way into the battlefield. Then put all land cards chosen this way into the battlefield. Tapped. Then put the rest in the bottom. Of your library in any order, so you can sack your lands to get a bunch more lands. <laughs> not not a particularly playable card. It's just an F. Yep, just an F. Yep. All right, we'll move us on. on to green. What's our first green card? Our first green card is Delighted Halfling. Green for a 1-2 Halfling Citizen. Uh, not legendary, worth noting. Tap, add colorless. Or tap, add one mana of any color. Spend it only to cast a legendary spell, and that spell can't be countered. Yeah, this is a good mana elf. This is really good. Yeah, this is really solid. Uh, like, even I, just without a legend in your opening hand, it's going to be good. 
I, I have it as just like a B plus. Yeah, no, I think so too. <laughs> yeah, it's it's gonna be great. All right, easy easy B plus for Delighted Halfling. Next yeah. up, we've got a, a, a level cards win the game on your own. This doesn't do that. But yes, like, you're gonna be very happy with this. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what's up next? Next, we have the Fall of Gilgalad. One and a green for a saga, a rare. Chapter one, scry two. Chapter two, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature you control. Chapter three, until end of turn, target creature you control gains when this creature dies, draw two cards. Then that creature fights up to one other target creature. I was going to read this one uh, originally, but I couldn't bear another mispronunciation, so I got you to read it. <laughs> um, you can send us and many of them to be as you want. All right, great. <laughs> I'm, I'm good to do this. <laughs> we, got, we got a lot of legends coming up. Um, yeah, this card is interesting. So the first mode, you get, just like we saw, it's like, okay, a little incidental thing. Second mode is pretty good. Put two counters on a creature. And the last mode's kind of funky. We haven't really seen an ability like this before. Or at least if we had, it's pretty rare. We're... You want the fight to happen, and you're often going to want to fight with something that's exactly going to kill the opponent's thing, so you can draw two cards. But then sometimes you're just, that's not true. Sometimes you're just, it's just a delayed, put two counters on something and fight, and you go from there. You don't care about drawing the two cards, so it's modal in that way. Yeah, when I first read this card, I started off super high on it, because, like, every chapter does something good, mm -hmm. as opposed to the other sagas, where they all were kind of medium. And then, like, Thinking about it more, I, I started to come down on it because you can't often play this on turn two. Mm -hmm. And then, like, even if you play it on turn three or four, and well, first of all, if you play it on turn three or four, you might be playing just this, right. which, like, is it awkward on the mana. But even then, if you play it and you only have one creature on the board, your opponent has their full turn cycle to, to kill your one creature or trade with it, and then chapter two does nothing right or hold a mana to like blow that like they see it coming once again with with these sagas they can they can interact with chapter three yeah and then same with chapter three like with either chapter two or chapter three they can respond like there's not a ton of instant speed interaction in the set but yeah. there is some and so if they can interact with you in response to choosing your creature for this for either chapter two or three it, it hurts but that being said like so i started to come down on it and then like seeing the power level of this set i started to come back up on it <laughs> I still think it has three very relevant chapters. It's only two mana. It's still a good card. Yes, I think so too. Yeah, I, I think it's it's also got a lot of you know play to it, both on your side and the opponent's side, like you were saying. But on your side, that third chapter, like you might just sometimes choose to sacrifice a one one and deal one damage to a thing. It's not even gonna die, and you're like, okay, well, I have a big creature. I just want to cash my one one for drawing two cards. You can do that too. So, yeah, where do you end up creating this? I want to say B plus, but it could honestly be like an A minus card. Yeah, I was just going to go B. Uh, I okay. don't think I want to go into the A range for this one. I think it's just a little bit too finicky, a little bit too slow, but I do like it. Yeah, I'm going to stay on B, but I, I would not be surprised if I come up to where you are after we play with it. Sure. Next up, we got Legolas. Is that this guy? Le 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 <laughs> yeah, I know. Legolas. I know Legolas. 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 Master Archer, one green green for a 1-4 legendary creature elf. It's a rare. It's got reach, of course, as all good archers do. It says, whenever you cast a spell that targets Legolas, put a plus one plus one counter on Legolas. And whenever you cast a spell that targets a creature you don't control, Legolas deals damage equal to its power to up to one target creature. Yeah, that uh, needs a little bit of setup. But like, like if, you, if you never trigger the second or third ability, uh, one four reach for three is not great, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be that hard to get like either the second or third line to do something. Yep, really good with fight yeah. spells, <laughs> right? Because they target two things. Yeah, like insane with fight spells. Yeah, huh? Yeah, just trigger it once. You're happy. Really nice. It's got heroic sort of as you know. Plus, well, this way, like if you trigger either ability once, I think you're you're happy. And so one four, yeah, and one four, just a good stat line, like we mentioned. Yeah, I, I like this card a lot. I think as long as you have some number of like you know two, three, four ways to trigger this, I think this card's gonna be like a B plus. Yeah, that's what I was gonna give it. Great, B plus for Legolas. Next up, we've got Elven Chorus. This is three and a green for an enchantment at rare. You may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast creature spells from the top of your library, and creatures you control have tap, add one many of one mana of any color. Yeah, the fact that this isn't a body is 
annoying because we've seen cards like this on bodies be mm -hmm. like really good. Yep. Like uh, the the auger from Midnight Hunt, whatever it was called, was uh, was re a really good card. Um, this is interesting though because there's a lot of scrying, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So like on average, there's going to be times where you hit like land, land on the top and you can't do anything. But there's also going to be times where you get to play multiple creatures in a row. Right. And the mana is not going to be as limiting a factor because this gives you a bunch of mana to pump into it. Yep. So this is like another one of those rares where it looks like it could be an F, but I don't, I don't actually think it's an F. Like, no. I think this may be like even like a C minus. Yeah, I think this one's better than a lot of the ones we were kind of like, eh, on the edge of D and F. Like, I think this is just a... In a slower deck, one that a green deck that wants to take its time a little bit more, has a reasonable creature count, 15 or so, I think this is just going to be a, a card you're happy to have. Like, I would, in that kind of deck, I would probably just give this, like, a C plus or a B minus. Well, you need to have a lot of creatures for it to get a good, a good grade. Sure, yeah. I think, you know, like, do you think 15 is too low? No, but, like, 15 means... Like like what less than well just just over one of out of every three cards you see is going to be a creature, mm -hmm. and that's like not great. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. If you put it in those terms, if you just do the math, I guess you're right. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll come down a little bit. I think I think we're both kind of like in the same space of how we want to grade it or where we want to play it. But I'm like giving it a slightly higher grade than I should probably. So yeah, I'll I'll say C minus then for Elven Course. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, like, the thought you like this is if you have creatures and scrying together, mm -hmm. right? Like, ideally creatures that scry, of which there are plentiful in this side. Yep, for sure. And what's next? Next we have the ring goes south. Three and a green for a sorcery. The ring tempts you, then reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal X land cards, where X is the number of legendary creatures you control. Put those lands onto the battlefield tapped and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Uh, no? Yeah, I agree. Okay. No. Yeah. Hard okay. to, it's, it's an explosive vegetation that you have to work for. So let's, uh, let's give another F here. Yeah. Next up, we've got Radagast the Brown. This is two green green for a 2-5 legendary creature avatar wizard at Mythic. Whenever Radagast the Brown or another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control... Look at the top X cards of your library where X is that creature's mana value. You may reveal a creature card that doesn't share a creature type with a creature you control from amongst those cards, put it into your hand, and put the rest on the bottom in any order. Or sorry, in a random order. Yeah, so it has to, like, it has to have no types that share. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, like, like, even if it's not an exact match, if half of it matches, you don't you don't get it. Yep. Um, so it's going to be hard to trigger this but i still think like it threatens enough that it's going to be like a card that your opponent really wants to kill and, and even if you get one card off of this the stats on it are pretty good yeah exactly and i think it's not going to be too hard over the course of the game to draw a card off of it with some selection so yeah and it goes up from there sometimes you do have a deck that's really it, it is really good in. very importantly like it's not a human Mm -hmm. like it's not an orc it's not a, a goblin like it's not one of the creature types that is gonna uh clash a lot with your other cards yep so it's more of the other things that, that you need to worry about so like if this is your own your only play on the battlefield you're only looking at uh at what it's four cards four it's mana value yep yeah so you're, you're pretty likely to find a card right away yeah that makes me like this card quite a bit i think if you're yeah, just looking at it as two five look at the top four take your creature Plus that that upside of maybe more in the more in the future, I think it's probably a B. I, I have it higher than that. Even higher, yeah. B plus. You can chain creatures, right? Like it. Oh, it, true. It yeah. Creature, it finds your creature, then you play that creature, and then that thing might find your creature. Like you can just keep going. Yeah. Okay. Want to go with the A range then? I think it's an A minus. Okay. Yeah. 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 No. No. I'll join you. That's right. Definitely. Definitely true. All right. Next up, we got Fangorn Tree Shepherd for Green 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 for a legendary tree folk at rare. It's a 410. <laughs> tree folk you control have vigilance. Whenever one or more tree folk you control attack, add twice that much green mana, and you don't lose unspent green mana as steps and phases end. Yeah, I mean the 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 I don't know if you remember the green uncommon quick beam. Yep. That was a six drop that triggered like it, it gave two things plus two plus two and trample when it or another tree folk came into play. So like curving that into this is is pretty 
pretty nuts. Like, that's a <laughs> ton of damage. Uh, that being said, seven mana for a 410, no come into play, you know, no extra abilities, no no reach, no life. Uh, not super excited about it. I think this is another one that borders on F to D minus. I was gonna say like D D plus. Sure. I'll say I'll say D for this. Yeah, it's just you're just not getting that much for your seven mana. Like I do think if you're there's I, I could see playing this with with like specifically with quick beam. I think if you're playing like a rampy green deck, tree folk, you might you might be happy to play this. Yeah, it's a lot of qualifiers. I'm, I'm gonna actually stamp it with the F, <laughs> and you know, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I'm happy to be wrong about this one, but I think you're just like never gonna be really that happy to play this card. Okay. Uh, next up, we've got Last March of the Ents. This is six green green for a sorcery at Mythic. The spell cannot be countered. You draw cards equal to the greatest toughness among creatures you control. Then put any number of creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. I've already entered our, our grade for this. Just an F on this one? <laughs> yep. Yep, I agree. I agree. You're just... It's just way too much mana. It, there was the card from Baldur's Gate that put the things like, you know, all your things onto the battlefield. Like, it seeked out a bunch of things and put them on. Putting one thing on is not does not make up for the fact that this costs us uh, whole eight mana. So, yep, not into it. All right. Uh, now we have a cycle of legendary lands. What's our first land here? First one is Barad Dur. Legendary land enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature. Taps for black, and you can pay X, X, black, and tap it to a mass orcs X. Activate only if a creature died this turn. Yeah, so this whole cycle of lands has this enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legend and it's just you know taps for one mana of whatever color it is that ability is not a bad thing to have around on a really low opportunity cost just tap land sometimes not even a tap land like it's going to be pretty easy i think to sequence it where this either you play it on turn one where it doesn't matter that much or you're, it's just going to come in untapped at some place yeah like these are the like i'm going to be happy i think all five of them i don't i don't remember but i think all five of them are, are either good to, to very good yep um and in each case, you're going to be very happy to replace a land. It's it's like getting an extra spell in, in your deck, basically, yeah. for free. Yeah, sweet. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm like, normally with lands like this, we rate them like C+, because you say you never cut them. I, I think I'm going to put these even up to, like, a B-. minus. Yeah, I was going to say B- minus for this one. Cool, yeah, the black one. I'm just going to say I'll call it the black one. I'm not going to call it the same. What, what, actually, say, say the name for us once more, Mark. <laughs> Baradur, Baradur, I Baradur, I think that's right, yeah. <laughs> I'll give Baradur a B- minus as well. Next up, we've got... Minas Turith. This is a legendary land, the white one, a rare. Taps to add whites, same as the last one. Enters tap unless you control a legend. And this one is one and a white tap to draw a card. Activate only if you have attacked with two or more creatures this turn. Yeah, again, this one. I, I, this one. Do you like this one more or less than the last one? I think I like it less. I think the, yeah, the I yeah. setup cost of attacking with two things. Like, often when you attack two things, you, like, have a trick to cast, and then also want to play a creature. I just think there's not going to be that many situations where you just have the two mana lying around, where you're, like, trying to press your advantage. You can attack with two creatures, because often, to enable the attack, you have to do something else. So, it's worse than the last one, for sure, but it's, again, pretty low opportunity cost. I think this one is more in that, like, C-plus range, where you're never going to cut it, but you're also not, like, just, like, this is going to win me the entire game. So I actually, I actually don't even think it's worse enough for me to give it a lower grade. Like I'm still gonna give it a, a B minus. Okay, yeah, I I am a little bit lower on this one. I would give it a C plus, but it's still pretty good. All right, next up, the red one. What do we have? The Mines of Moria, legendary land. Enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature. Taps for red. Pay three and a red. Tap it and exile three cards from your graveyard to create two treasure tokens. Yeah, this one not as impactful as the last two we just looked at um yeah this is probably the the worst one yeah it's it's kind of funny because all of these you know we're talking about like you never cut them from your deck but it's also like how highly do you take them in the draft because i think you know these tend to it's a rare it's just if you're drafting out arena it's most likely going to go pretty early um this one's probably going to go a little bit later because you know it does playability does come um it does factor in there so you see this middle of the pack like pick six are you taking a C level common over it, or are you just going to take this card if you're in red? Well, well, part of this is going to be dependent on whether I've like settled into a lane or not, right? Because mm -hmm. like if if you like start off the draft with like a bunch of white cards, and then you end up getting past like some you know some some red cards, and then you're sol solidly in red white, then you're going to have enough playables that this land's going to be like much better than just taking a a twenty third card for your for your sideboard. Yep. But if you've like started off with a white card and then you you know you hedged on like a 
a blue red gold card and then you got a green card and it, like it took you a little while to find your lane you're going to be a little harder pressed for playables i'm going to be more likely to pass these lands to make sure i get enough playables to, to be to have 23 cards i'm happy with yeah definitely so this one i think we're, we're giving this one a C. sorry say again i'm giving this one a, a c plus yeah i would say that too it's just like it has some push and pull where where you're drafting it but again it's you're never cutting it yeah next up rivendell legendary land uh same stuff as the last one the ability is one in a blue tap scry two but activate only if you control a legendary creature yeah uh if, if you can activate it like we've seen blue having a lot of spells mm -hmm. so i i do think that like out of all the colors likely to have a legendary creature in play blue and maybe black might be the least likely to have them which is kind of funny but that's like we've seen scry two for four mana on a land before and that was very powerful yep and this is just two mana yeah yeah i like this one a lot too uh this is i think this is another one that's kind of in the b minus range probably I'm happy to put a B minus for this. Yeah, not only is just you know digging quite at a, at a good rate, but for all your cards they care about scrying is just like repeatable trigger those thing on on land, and that's that's pretty exciting. And uh, the last one here, the Shire Legendary Lands, the green one. The ability is one green tap tap an untapped creature you control, create a food token. Yeah, I think this is the best one. Best one, yeah. Just the rate is so good, just pumping out those rectangles, gaining three life yeah. every turn. Or using them, and you don't. Like, it's not like the like the black one gives you board presence, but you need something to die. This one, you just need any creature in play. Yeah, this is great. I think this one goes up to a B. Yeah, that's okay. I'm with you there. Sweet B for the Shire and our uh, our last legendary land here. It's a little bit different. This is Mount Doom, a legendary land at Mythic. Tap, pay a life, add red or black. It's got an ability one black red tap. Mount Doom deals one damage to each opponent, and another ability five red black tap. Sacrifice Mount Doom and a legendary artifact. Choose up to two creatures, then destroy the rest. Activate only as a sorcery. Yeah, so there are actually a bunch of legendary artifacts we're going to get to mm -hmm. that are that are rare and mythic. Um, there's also, if you make your, your mana worker your ring bearer, you have a, a legendary artifact. Yep, that's kind of cool. <laughs> but it's not going to be that easy to yep. get a legendary artifact. Like, uh, and, and if you don't have the capability of activating that last ability like not being able to tap this without losing life is is a real cost right yeah just having the like the pain lands you saw in dominaria i think is the last time we saw it, or dominaria united those not dinging you you being colorless sometimes that was okay but always having to pay the life is is much worse yeah, but I, like if, if you're extremely aggressive, you're going to be fine to pay the life and you're going to like that second ability. Mm -hmm. Or if you're in a spot where you somehow ended up with like three legendary artifacts and you have like a, a real chance of activating that last ability. Like I, I do think this is going to be playable in either of those two decks. Yeah, it's another one of those cards just like, you know, once in every... 20 drafts you're gonna be like oh i got the seventh pick and that's actually might be good but it's not gonna be a card you really ever take highly so i think just like a, a, a d, d plus? yeah d minus is probably what it's i just think it's this card's very very really gonna actually make your deck i'll give it a d you all can, right you can... moving on to artifacts now what do we have for our first artifact horn of the mark two mana legendary artifact so it works you can throw this into mount doom and whenever <laughs> two or more creatures you control attack a player Look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Hmm. Kind of similar to the white land we saw, uh, where, you know, you have to attack two things. This one is the mana up front, and then you don't have to keep paying mana. Kind of a hard one to evaluate. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think this is good. But, like, it's also not every deck like it doesn't help you just kill the opponent right and a lot of times if you're aggressive and attacking and, you, and if you're always going to have two creatures attacking like you'd rather just have a combat trick yeah it's like more of a mid-range card than an aggro card really but you need yeah but you need to have like two creatures you're you're attacking with mm -hmm. but you only really need like one good attack like let's say you play the 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 clarion cathars the three three plus a one one yep and let's say they have like like a two three I think you're you're fine throwing away your one one to like get another 
real creature off of this. Yeah, I think so too. And plus the ring bear that you'll have is often going to be a decent attacker plus one kind of beefier creature. And this is unlike that white land we were talking about. You, you invest the mana at some point. You never have to pay for it again. So you can have a trick to maybe make kind of an unfavorable attack on paper, but then you have a trick to actually win the combat. Yeah, I think, I think I'm think i talking myself up on this card. I don't think it's amazing still, but I think it would give it like a C+. Plus. C plus, I'm going to go C. I'm just, I'm okay. just going to go very slightly lower than Yeah, that. yeah, for sure. And, and like you said, I think in your aggro decks, you actually probably don't want this card as much, even though it kind of reads like you would want it there. Next up, we've got Sting, the Glinting Dagger. Two mana for legendary artifact equipment. Rare. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one, and has haste. At the beginning of combat, untap equipped creature. And equipped creature has first strike as long as it's blocking or blocked by a goblin or orc. Equip two. Yeah, well, we haven't really talked about this, but uh, I know you haven't seen all the all the movies. But there's just there's so much good flavor in this set. Oh, look! Like, really, really just take a minute to appreciate all the flavor here. I'm picking up on like I'd say I'm picking up on a good forty percent of it. So <laughs> that's enough for me for the set review. I'm sure chat will tell me all about what I'm missing as we play the set. Um, yeah, I, from and from what I've heard, people are pretty happy with the flavor. Aside from the ring being, you know, unflavorful. I, yeah, the actual ring emblem. Yeah. 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 So but, uh, two, this two mana, card, yeah. It's it's a little, a little much for what you're getting. I find like plus it's basically plus one plus one haste and vigilance, right? Two mana, and I, not so sure about that. Like probably borderline playable. There is a few equipment payoffs where you're going to be happy with this, but mm -hmm. if you don't have those, I'm not like thrilled about this thing. Yeah, I think this is probably just another like D D plus level card. Maybe D plus as it's a little more playable than some than some of the other D level cards we've been talking about. But hey, it's I'm not an go... exceptional equipment. Okay, I'm gonna go C minus. Okay, I, I think cool. it's a little, a little better than that. But yeah, what's up next? Next we have Glamdring, two mana for another legendary artifact. This is another equipment. Equip cost is three. Equipped creature has first strike and gets plus one plus zero oh for each instant and sorcery in your graveyard. And whenever a equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you may cast an instant or sorcery from your hand with mana value less than or equal to the damage without paying its mana cost. So it's kind of a uh, slightly different Rune Chanter's Pike, which we just Rune saw. Pike, yeah. We saw that in, in Brothers War back in. It wasn't particularly good there, but... I think... It was for me. <laughs> oh, 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 tell me about it. Please, let, let me hear it. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, there's two decks. I don't remember exactly what was in them, but there's two decks where I played Rune Chanter's Pike. Both of them were were blue white soldiers, based with a bunch of spells. And uh, yeah, like I, I don't know, plus a bunch and first strike. Like the first strike is really the key. If you're giving something plus two plus one first strike, mm -hmm. it's especially on flyers, it's it adds up really quickly. It's almost impossible to block. But uh, this is equipped three instead of two, and the extra benefit you're getting for that isn't really that great like the the casting something for free maybe maybe not but then you're in like a weird spot where you have this is your equipment you have creatures that are able to attack and you have like spells in your hand that you're not casting right a lot like everything needs to line up perfectly for you to get some value out of this yeah kind of a lot of hoops so like it, yeah that's the tension right you, it ideally goes in a spell heavy deck but then you're just not you don't want equipment in your spell heavy decks all that often unless you're in that spot where you've got all those spells that do create creatures yeah i think this is another one i'm gonna start low on like a d um i could be convinced to come up a little bit on it would you would you would you want to tempt me with a, a c minus or something or I, I was gonna give it a c minus okay. like even even Okay, if there's zero instance or sorcery, obviously it's bad. But yep. like first strike that you can move around is still like a dangerous ability. Like yeah, first strike definitely. is a very powerful ability. I agree. And then if you're giving it like even plus one in first strike, it's going to allow you to trade up pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. You're threatening combat tricks. Like first first strike is just such a good ability. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll join you C minus then for Glamdring. Okay. Next up, we got Horn of Gondor. This is three mana for a legendary artifact. It says, when Horn of Gondor enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 white human soldier token. And 3-tap, create X 1-1 white human soldier tokens, where X is the number of humans you control. Yeah, so this is, I think this is probably deserving of a build-around grade. Because you want to have enough humans that you're like, you're not like, oh, I can never, ever block with my 1-1, my because then this is never going to do anything. Yeah, you're, you're, you're spending 3 mana for a 1-1 that 
like you said, doesn't you don't want to block with it. It's not like it gives you a buffer because that is adding to your human count. Um, and it it takes over pretty quickly, like exponentially, just growing kind of a, a krenko that you need to pay mana for. Yeah, I think a builder and grave is about right for this because you you do just need to have. You can't just be spending three, 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 and then getting to a spot where it's actually adding up to a lot. You need to have, start at a point where you're getting two, or you're get yeah, you're probably getting two on that first activation a good amount of the time. Right, because even if you, even if you're on a board stall and you and you don't have to block with this, like you're paying three mana for a one one, then you're paying six mana for two one ones, then you're paying nine mana for four one ones, and you're still like at an awful rate, right? Like, so it's pretty slow you really need to have multiple other humans i think you need at least like 12 15 humans in your deck before you're you're gonna play this and and it also like doesn't go in an aggressive deck so yep. pretty pretty niche but i do think build around it's like it does just win the game yeah i love the duality of chat here we have some people saying this card's nuts and some people saying this card's mid <laughs> so yeah i what build around grade would you even give it though because i i think even in a deck, number one, that number you gave, 12, 15, like, that's a lot of humans. That is not trivial. Like, there are humans in the set, but it's not like you're splitting that with elves and goblins and, you know, other prevalent creature types. And even then, yeah. you can definitely yeah. get out-tempoed with this card. Yeah, I, I'm going to give it, like, a build around B, I think. Mm -hmm. I was going to go a little bit I, lower. I just want having, like, again, like, 12 humans, which is going to be tough. Yeah, I, I'm going to go lower on this. I think, like, build around C, because I still think even if you get, meet that deck building requirement, it it is three, and then three, and then most likely three again before you're actually getting somewhere, and that's, your your opponent can't do stuff in the meantime. It's another one of those cards that they kind of see it coming, they can kind of plan for it, kind of shift to a more aggressive game plan, uh, force you to trump if, uh, if they don't want you to start going off with this. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be a little bit lower, but it's got potential. So, well, just, sorry, just to stand no, this card a little bit. But you can just play this on turn six. And if you have, like, another human in play, mm -hmm. like, you're immediately getting one and then two more. Right. right. So, like, three tokens right away on the board. And then you untap. And then, like, I don't I don't think it's, like, that hard to have it start to snowball pretty quickly. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll stick with my C, but I'm, I'm willing to come up on it. Okay. Next up, we got Mithril Coach. This is three mana for a legendary artifact equipment, a rare. Flash, indestructible. When Mithril Coat enters the battlefield, attach the target legendary creature you control. Equip creature has indestructible. Equip cost is three. This is one of the cards that I really dislike just mm -hmm. because I, I almost never want to put it in my deck, but it's going to be so <laughs> annoying to play against sometimes. Right. Yeah, you're not getting a stat boost. Indestructible always reads better than it is. Right, like you're like, oh, like my creature's gonna be indestructible, but like sometimes you're it's just an infinite trump blocker. Sometimes you can't actually get through. Like you only got a three three, you need a combat trick to get through their four four. It's not that cheap. <laughs> like three and three, obviously you get that free uh, equip the first time, and it's probably gonna happen. But yeah, I don't love this card. Yeah, once you get your your ring bear up to the death touch level, then then it starts to get pretty spicy. That's cool. Yeah. But that's a lot of, like, that's three Tempt cards, plus a creature, plus your Mithril Code. So, I, I, yeah, I am I want to give this, like, a D plus. Yeah, that's what I was, I was going to even just give it a lower grade, probably a D. But, uh, D? Okay. yeah. And, and, and the thing is, even if you do have a lot of legendary creatures, like, you know, most decks will, it's still three mana to hold up for that first indestructible. Like, sure, you can use it in a combat, but if you're using it kind of like a Cyber Cryptomancer, Angelic Intervention type of card, three is meaningfully more than two so and even it doesn't if, even like you can only save legendary creatures yeah exactly so it's yeah. a little bit tough there too all right what's up next next we have file of galadriel three mana for a legendary artifact if you would draw a card while you have no cards in hand draw two cards instead if you would gain life while you have five life or or less you gain twice that much life tap to add one mana of any color so this card kind of good I think so. Yes. Yeah, right? It, it kind of reads like a card that wouldn't be that great, but it's a manolith that after you dump your hand, you just start drawing two cards a turn. And it and the, the mana boost helps you dump your hand faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously this is not an aggro card. You want to be somewhere in the you know range, shades of mid-range to more controlling, but in those decks, I, I think you're just going to be pretty happy with this. 
Yeah, and then even like there's there's enough food in the set that you can potentially gain six off of food when you when you start to get low. True. Yeah. I'm I'm not like super high on this card, no. but I think it's I think it's like uh B plus, I'm gonna say. I was gonna go a little bit lower than that. I was gonna give it a B minus, but I, I think it definitely is probably way better than a lot of people are expecting if they just read it and like you know, a lot of the cards we've been looking at are like, all right, weird commander thing, but that's not this card. This actually has good application. So I had to be a little bit lower, but You you said B minus? B minus, yeah. So I said C plus. So you're, oh, high, sorry. you're I think you said B plus. I was surprised about okay, that. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh next up we have Okay, you know, you know what? I'm going to give this one to you. What's the name of this thing? <laughs> it seems important. Andrew, Flame of the West. Say Three one more time. One more time for us. <laughs> it's Anduriel. There we Gotta go. The nice. Go. Love yeah. it. All right, what to do? Flame of the West. Three mana legendary artifact, another equipment. Uh, equipped creature gets plus three, plus one. Equipped for two mana. And when equipped creature attacks, create two tapped 1-1 one, one white spirit tokens with flying. If that creature is legendary, instead create two of those tokens that are tapped and attacking. Well, this is a good one. <laughs> Jeez, that's the equipment. Holy. Yeah, this thing's really good. This thing's really good. Like, not only is the stat boost pretty good, like, three and two for plus three, plus one. It's not a bad stat boost. Like, that's pretty good. But those tokens, holy. That, and that's the thing. They just keep pumping out tokens. You keep getting more stuff to put the equipment on. Like, even if you just send in your thing and it dies and you get the spirits, you just keep on going. Just keep on going. Yeah, this, this is an equipment that does excite me. Uh, I think this is, you know, it, I, it's kind of akin to a sword in a lot of ways, like a sword of X and X that we've seen pretty recently. And those have been good, but not like super mega busted. I think I would say it's about in the same range as those cards. So I, I would give this a B plus. B plus? Yeah, I was, I think I want to give this an A minus. Yeah, just just for that. Yeah. Yeah, potential to really just snowball the game. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll come up with you. Okay. Sweet. All right, uh, here's a weird one. This is... Uh, Palantir of Orthanc. This is three mana for a legendary artifact at Mythic. At the beginning of your end step, put an influence counter on Palantir, uh, pa Palantir of Orthanc and scry two. Then target opponent may have you draw a card. If that player doesn't, you mill X cards where X is the number of influence counters on this thing and target player or that player loses life equal to the total mana value of those cards. Yeah, this is weird. I theory. think it's bad. I think so too. Like, so let let's 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 go through how this works, mm -hmm. right? So you cast it. It has no no board presence. Never will. Immediately triggers. You put one counter on it. You get to scry two. Maybe you get like benefit off of scrying two because there's things that do trigger off of that. Mm -hmm. So that that's like, you know, don't don't discount that. But then like, what are you scrying to the top? Right. Like, if you scry two and you see. A good card that at this point, like a four drop that you can curve into, well, your opponent's just gonna have you mill it, mm -hmm. and then they're gonna take four. But then, like, you get the worst card on top of your deck, so you, like that's pretty bad for you. And then the second time that they're gonna mill, both cards that you've scryed, like the scry is almost irrelevant because you're they're just milling them anyways. And then if if your opponent starts to get low on life, they can choose to give you cards, and that's never a good option to have. So I'm talking a lot about this card, but I think I think it's just bad. Yeah, I think I think it's one of the it just it it is secretly kind of just like a Punisher card where it's just like your opponent gets too much choice and when the choice when choice A is good they'll just choose B and when choice B is good they'll choose A because if you think about it you're paying three mana to do close to nothing and so your opponent goes okay sure Mill I take a little bit of damage but that damage isn't going to matter as much because you play the three mana nothing so yeah it's it, this is another card that I'm sure you're, you're going to lose to it sometimes but. I think on average this card is just not good. I don't I don't quite think I'm gonna give it enough though. Mm -hmm. Like there's enough going on here that like because you scry two, you can you can if your opponent's low, you can just put something expensive on top, right? Mm -hmm. And then like if they're low, they basically have to give you a card, which it's not good to have the option, but it, it does add up damage pretty quickly too. So like I, I wanna give it like a like a like like a D, I guess. Yeah, I was gonna give it a D too. Like it, it definitely doesn't do nothing, right? It's not just like stone. Yeah. This is bad, but I think more often than not, your opponent's gonna have a little too much breathing room to play around this, and it's just like, you know, 
you're not going to get the outcome you want too often. So D for this one, but again, another one that, like, there's so many cards in this set I'm excited to play, just to be like, oh, okay, like, I see exactly how this is, and this is definitely going to be one of them. If I open it during <laughs> early access, I'm going to be very happy to take it and play it. Um, is, next is up. This, oh, sorry, good. Is this, so, yeah, sorry, no, no, I know ahead. you're about to go. Is this a little closer to, what, what was that? What was the thing that made an, an X1 and the X was Forge of Urbrask or something? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. that's uh, Urbrask Forge, I think it was. Yeah, the, 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 the thing ended up being way better than I gave it credit for mm -hmm. on uh, a set review. Because, like, this this is potentially a lot of damage adding up pretty quickly, right? Like, Yeah, like, on average, I think the first time it'll take you know somewhere you know an average number is kind of weird but sometimes they take zero sometimes they take like three or four well your average cmc in most decks is going to be like 2.8 or right. whatever right like Two so so yeah they take, they take three damage the first time which is like that's that's a chunk of damage yeah or you can just put a land on top and then you mill the land and you don't draw the land mm -hmm. right like and but like the milling actually helped you <laughs> dig deeper but don't you just want to put the card on the bottom at that point because then you get closer to like a spell or you get closer to a spell that will ding them even if they do choose to mill you but you have that choice sure sure yeah I mean, i'm just saying like it, you you said you could top a land but if you think they're going to mill you don't you just want to bottom that land anyways uh the answer is that is, is probably yes yeah <laughs> there you go okay <laughs> if it's like a really good card second right like then you don't want it mill right there could be a spot where you like leave land and then you're like busted card second and then either either way you're getting that card the next turn right because either you're drawing it or you're milling it yeah i i think that it has some potential but we're i think we're right to start low on it but we'll see, we'll see. I, I, i'm gonna talk myself up to to a c minus okay okay yeah yeah i like it yeah. i like it uh okay. next up oh the one ring baby this is four mana for legendary artifact mythic indestructible when the one ring enters the battlefield if you cast it you gain protection from everything until your next turn. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life for each bird encounter on the one ring. Tap, put a bird encounter on the one ring, then draw a card for each bird encounter on the one ring. Is is this going to be in digital draftable packs? Uh, yeah. It is. Yes. Oh, okay. I did. I, I just assumed it wasn't, so I just like didn't even look at oh, it. Oh no, but, yeah, okay. it's a real card. Well, it's a real card, but it's like there's only one of them, isn't there? No, no. No, no, there's only oh, one of the, oh, the oh, nice oh, art. One, oh, one out of oh, one. Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, that's a yeah, yeah, the cool art with, with, okay, it, with okay, the inscription okay. on it. You can actually see the inscription. See, it doesn't have the inscription here. Okay, yeah. I got it now. Okay, so people will open this. Yes. Okay, I, I, I yeah, I, I got it now. Too many newfangled fancy things <laughs> they're doing with packs these days. I know when I when I was by the way, uh, I didn't mention this at the top, and I'm sure YouTube comments might be commenting this. There's actually a lot of rares in this set that aren't actually in this set. They're like numbers, if you look at the collector number, it's like number 285 and everything past 280 is in jumpstart packs or some other starter thing. So you might be asking, oh, where's this rare? It's just not in draftable boosters. Uh, so if you're looking, is this a draftable card? LTR at the bottom in the corner, the set code isn't necessarily going to tell you that. Look at the collector number right above it. Everything 280 and above is not in packs. This one is though. Okay, so well, uh, it was a nice thing for you to monologue there because it gave me a chance to read this. <laughs> it's a weird one. So you, so you can actually in the draft cast the One Ring into into Mount Doom and blow and blow everything up. Yes, you can. I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, that's so, that's so cool. Yeah. Right. <laughs> huh. Okay. Is it is this card good though? That's the next question. I guess that's the question that we're we're trying to answer today. <laughs> yeah, that is our job as set reviewers today. So yeah. let's see how it plays out. It comes in, it gains you some amount of life because your opponent can't attack you. They can't, you gain protection. They're not going to deal damage. And that sort of makes up, either, right? sorry, say again. You, the coercion targets too, the black coercion. So there's like potentially upside there. Sure. Too, yeah, your opponent can't, can't cast hard or discard. Yeah. It's a, it's a four mana indestructible Phyrexian arena. If you just tap it once and you know, it's always going to be available to you with gain, some amount of virtual life so you kind of get uh you can you kind of get spotted some i don't think they're ever going to want to tap it twice i think it's always just going to be or almost always just going to be tap it once and then don't care past that no it, it's not an arena because you only oh you have to keep going sorry it's not, it's not an upkeep yeah, yeah I, I don't i thought it was an arena for some reason yeah you have to keep tapping to draw okay i'm much less into it now then sorry yeah yeah this card's just like 
pretty bad. Yes, right? yes. Never mind. I I think his card is quite bad. Yeah, you like. Let's just say you gain a virtual three life. Huh. But that's interesting. You gain a virtual three life when you cast it or around there because your opponent can't attack you that turn and you just activate it twice. That's a four mana draw three. They can still attack you and loot with their ring bearer, right? They just can't deal you any damage. Um, No, because you, you can't be dealt damage. Like protection means you can't be dealt damage so they won't the, the trigger won't happen, right? It doesn't need to deal oh, damage. Oh, sorry, you just want it attacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then it still pings you because on your upkeep, it yeah, it, yeah. Never mind then. It it's just not very good because if it was like you could choose, of course that's the flavor here. You can't choose once you've tapped it. It's gonna keep dinging you each turn. So yeah, no, no, no. Never mind. I I think this is just an F. Okay. Yeah, I think I think I'm with you there. On that. <laughs> that was a reading comprehension one. Sorry for everybody. <laughs> like they were just like, oh, what's this do? Yeah, no, this one's not very good. Unfortunately. Yeah. It's too bad. I mean, you, I think you're you're contractually obligated to play it if you have Mount Doom. But, of course. Like, it, Enough otherwise. Yeah. Uh, all right. Now we're getting to the gold cards. Closing us out here. First one is Pippin, Guard of the Citadel. Blue white for a 2 2 legendary creature at rare, Halfling Soldier. It's got Vigilance and Ward 1. And it's got the ability Tap. Another target creature you control gains protection from the card type of your choice until end of turn. This card's just really good. Good. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, Mother of Runes S card, Giver of Runes, whatever you want to call it. Screlve for as a contemporary example. And. Yeah, the board one's gonna matter some amount of the time. It's you know it's nice when you get to cast this on two. Your opponent doesn't get to just get to snap it off uh, at the end of their turn with the three damage removal spell or something. Yeah, this card's great. Yeah, it doesn't protect itself. No, it's still gonna be like uh, like. Would you put this in the A minus range or is, or is it B plus? Yeah, I think I think A minus range just because it is actual protection and not uh, you know like the fake protection like you've seen on Skrull, for example. Like you can do the yeah. the block. And uh, give protection. You threaten to do that. You can send things through. Yeah, this card's very good. I would give an A minus. Yeah. Protection from creatures just means it's straight unblockable. Yeah. Yes. So. And, and just yeah, can block any number of things. Well, you know, okay. can, can block yeah. and uh, not die. Other things that is. Yes. Yeah. Next up, Next we have, is yeah, go ahead. of Ethelian, two blue white for a three three legendary human noble. At the beginning of your end step, choose an opponent. So you're going to choose. Your, your opponent. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of that player's <laughs> next end step, you draw a card if they didn't attack you that turn. Otherwise, create three 1-1 one, one white human soldier tokens. So a small rules thing on this, just to note, if Farmir dies, uh, you'll still get the trigger. It creates a reflexive trigger, so this is always going to happen. As, as long as the trigger happens, it doesn't die before your end step. When you choose this, it's going to go off. As long as you, you make it to your end step. Uh, yes, as long as you make it to your end step. On your opponent's, like you'll get the, the thing... You get either your card or your three or your three threes or three three one ones. It doesn't matter if this dies as long as you make it to your end step and this triggers the first time. Yeah, I think this thing's very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty rare that they have an opportunity to kill this. Uh, and you're happy if this comes in draws you card. You're happy if this makes you three tokens. And if you ever get to do this twice, it's it's just fantastic. You want to give it a uh, a minus again? Yeah, I was just going to give it an a minus. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. What's next? Next, we have Sauron's Ransom. One blue black for an instant. Choose an opponent. They look at the top four cards of your library and separate them into a face down and face up pile. Put one pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard, and the ring tempts you. So, we got another uh, Atris game going on here. Yeah, this is cool. And the, the ring tempting you is like, I think this card would be pretty good without the ring tempting you, right? Just three mana instant, draw two ish, have some selection a little bit, get some information. And the ring tempting you is just a nice little upside? Hmm. Yeah. Atris coming on a 3-2 menace is definitely better than this card. <laughs> that, sure. that That's definitely a big upside. But it's pretty cheap. It's instant? I don't know. I, I think as far as draw spells goes, this is a really good one. Yeah, you want to give this like, uh, like a B? Yeah, I was going to go B on this one. Yeah, that's cool. Surrounds Ransom gets a B. Next up, we've got Sharky, Tyrant of the Shire. This is two blue black for a 2 4 legendary creature, Avatar Rogue at rare. Activated abilities of lands your opponents control can't be activated unless they're mana abilities. Sharky has all abilities of lands your opponents control except mana abilities, and mana abilities can, uh, man mana of any type can be spent to activate Sharky's ability. So it really just shuts down those like rare legendary land things, I think. Yeah, it's it's kind of just like a a rare gold pillar field box for the most part. Yeah, not not great. Not good. Like no. uh, D D minus. Yeah, D, it's got power and toughness. Can't give it enough, but a D minus. Yeah. All right, what do we have next? 
Next we have Shagrat Loot Bearer. Two black red for a 4-4 legendary orc soldier. Whenever it attacks, attach up to one target equipment to it, then a mass X, where X is the number of equipment attached to it. So this isn't quite as power and toughness, the text doesn't matter, as the last one. And the power and toughness is better. It's a 4 mana 4-4. Four, four. Um, and you're going to have an equipment once in a while. We looked at some decent rare ones. There's going to be some, you know, uncommon or uncommon ones that you might put in your deck. So the text isn't zero, but it's also it's not, you shouldn't value it too highly, I don't think. Yeah, I was going to give this like a C. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's like 4 mana 4-4 four, four is like C minus-ish. You have that little little boost of sometimes you do get some value. Next sure. up, the Balrog, Durden's Bay. This is 7 mana. It's 5 red black for a 7-5 legendary creature at rare. This spell costs 1 less to cast for each permanent sacrifice this turn. It's got haste, and it says it can't be blocked except by legendary creatures. And when it dies, destroy target artifact or creature an opponent controls. Yeah, so the only way you're really sacrificing stuff before casting this is, like, treasures. There's not a lot of ways to make treasures in, in black-red. Right. Um, aside from, like, that 3-3 three, three red rare thing that we saw that makes treasures when you play a historic spell. Mm -hmm. So I think this is just going to cost 7 most of the time. And as a 7-mana, seven 7-5 seven, haste with, like, slight upside, it's not great. Like, mm -hmm. it's fine, but I don't think it's that good. Yeah. Yeah, seven, seven mana. mana a lot. It's good when it comes down, but it is going to be seven mana almost always. Yeah, like if you sacrifice a food, you're adding one to this cost, right? Like, because you're paying two to sack the food and discounting it by one. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we saw any free sack outlets yesterday. Maybe one or two? There's, there's a couple, is there? I think. Yeah, so sometimes it's going to be six. Well, I, th I think. Yeah, there's like a couple that cost one. There's also like the trebuchet, little sacrifice end sure, of combat. Sure, that's true. Well, then how are you? Oh, it's end of combat. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to cost six. Sorry, yeah, say again? Yeah. But then you're not attacking with this with haste. Yeah. It's going to cost six sometimes. I think you should generally have just evaluate this as seven mana. It is, yeah, like you mentioned, treasure kind of pays for two of it, quote unquote. Yeah, treasure. This is good with treasure, but right. it's, it's not easy to get treasure in this set. There is that red common that's a mass two create a treasure token that's that's kind of nice with this hmm yes, yeah i don't know what, what do you want to give it then i want to give it like a c i was gonna go c a little minus. bit higher i was gonna give it like a c plus i do think there is some upside there like if you can cast this for six mana it is quite good and i, I do think in your black red decks you're gonna be able to do that some amount of the time sure yeah, yeah okay I'll, I'll stick with c and you'll 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 put you down for c plus cool um sure. just quickly chat point is that on our last card Shagrat's Loot Bearer, the uh, four mana Rakdos thing that cares about equipment and amasses when you um, have an equipment, or sorry, amasses equal to your equipment number, it can steal your opponent's equipment and attach it to it. I mean, they get to re-equip it, but if it's not just counting your own equipment. It says, when Shagrat attacks, attach up to one target equipment to it, so you can't actually, for the turn, go, whoop, goes to mine. So just worth noting, I'm sure uh, that will come up at some point. Yeah, and then your opponent can still pay to re-equip it to one of their creatures, but they have to do that potentially every turn. Yeah, exactly. All right, what's uh, our next card here? Next we have Gimli, Mournful Avenger. One red-green for 3-2 Legendary Dwarf Warrior. He has Indestructible as long as two or more creatures died under your control this turn. And whenever another creature you control dies, put a plus one plus one counter on Gimli. When this ability resolves for a third time this turn, Gimli fights up to one target creature you don't control. That's a really weird card. <laughs> yeah, like, how are you sacrificing so many creatures? Yeah. Uh. And, like, why... You, you need to sacrifice them either mid-combat or pre-combat for it to have indestructible that matters. Because, like, if the creatures die in combat, it doesn't matter that it's indestructible at that point. So I guess the use case of it is, like, you play a two-drop, you play this, you attack... They either trade off the two drop or they take the damage. If they trade, Gimli grows a little bit. I, I guess that's kind of the idea. Well, yeah, like the indus the growing is is relevant. Right? Yeah. Whenever another creature you control dies, it gets plus one plus one counter. That that's an ability. But then the two creatures and then the three creatures thing, I just think is almost like flavor text. Yeah, I think this is not going to the the, the most of the words in this card are not going to matter very often. I think it's still decent as a three two that that potentially grows yeah. like. Almost like I mean, you can play it and then attack with your two drop, and if they trade, you've got a you've got a four three. I think this is like a C plus. 
Yeah, I would say so too. Worth noting, this is you do have to have it on the battlefield. It's not like an end step thing. So they they do get the knowledge of this is on the battlefield. It's not like you can trade off and then go up oh, Gimli four three. Um, but yeah, C plus for Gimli. Yeah. All right, Door of Durin. This is three red green for a legendary artifact or rare. Whenever you attack, scry two. Then if you then you may reveal the top card of your library. If it's a t creature card, put it onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. Until your next turn, it gains trample if you control a dwarf and hexproof if you control an elf. That's kind of funny. Yeah, no, weird card. Yeah, one of the tougher ones to evaluate, I think. Yeah, because you have to put it on tapped and attacking, so it needs to be a creature that has like a good attack. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think it's it's another one where I'm leaning towards it being bad. I think so too. Yeah, I think like. Some amount of the time, you're going to cast this, and it's just going to miss, right? You're just going to scry two, and you're not going to see anything. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is mostly bad, like... And you need to be attacking for this to do anything. Like, if you're on the defense, it's yeah. just still blank. Yeah, it's like, the it's kind of that, the absolute fail case is that, you're on defense. The next fail case is you miss, and the fail case after that, <laughs> if those two things are okay, is you hit a creature that gets eaten when it attacks. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna give it a cowardly D minus. Yeah, me too. I, th I think so too. That's uh, that's probably a decent grade. All right, so we got Samwise Gamgee over here. Re uh, green white for a two two legendary creature, halfling peasant. It's a rare. Whenever another non token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you create a food token, and you can sacrifice three food to return target historic card from your graveyard to your hand. This thing looks pretty good. Yeah, that's sweet. Yeah, like every other non-token creature gets you a food token. I'm I'm in for that. And yeah, that, white's that's free. great. Hmm. Sorry, I interrupted you. What were you saying? Yeah, no, that, that was it. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and green, white, green, green, and white are both the colors that want to be making food tokens, right? So. Yeah, you just you just play this on two. Your opponent's gonna really be pressured to kill it as soon as they can, and all your yeah, all your things making food. Yeah, that's great. Uh, is this like an a B plus, A minus? Yeah, I think I was going to say B plus. All right, yeah. Let's give B plus to Samwise. What do we have next? Next we have Aragorn, Company Leader. One green white for a 3-3 three, three legendary human ranger. Whenever the ring tempts you, you choose if you choose a creature other than Aragorn as your ring bearer, put your choice of a counter from among First Strike, Vigilance, Death Touch, and Lifelink on him. And whenever you put one or more counters on Aragorn, put one of each of those type kinds of counters on up to one other target creature. So basically, this does nothing unless you're attempting the ring, or I, I guess actually you could just put counters on them other ways, potentially. Yep. But most of the time, you're going to have to tempt the ring, and then both Aragorn and your other creature are going to get First Strike, Vigilance, Death Touch, or Lifelink. Man, if you are in a deck with a decent amount of tempting, this card's really, really good. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So I think most of your decks are just going to have... We, we didn't really give, go over like a, an average number or something, but after we've seen most of the set now, do you have like a ballpark for how many tempting cards do you think your average deck's going to have? Oh, no, I, I haven't... I haven't gone I, through that, I, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to place, I think, before you actually play. But The combination of First Strike and then like Death Touch right after? Yeah. That's, those two together are disgusting. I think it's prevalent enough that this is very rarely just going to be a 3-3. Basically, I think you're going to trigger this most of the time you cast it. And that's... I think even just triggering it once is really good. Like, just giving... With that combo, like you said, or just giving lifelink to this and something else big. This is this is in the A range, I would say. I, I'm i not as high on it as you. Mm -hmm. I was going to give this a B. Okay, yeah. I'm going to go to the A-. I think, I think just the fact that this... It does need something else to be good. Right, you do need to be tempting, but I think that's just going to happen most of the time, and the reward for that is is really quite good. So, yeah, I'll stick with my A-, minus, but I could, be, I could be talked down after playing with it. Sure. All right, what do we have next? Next we have Arwen, Mortal Queen, one green-white for a 2-2 legendary elf noble. It enters the battlefield with an indestructible counter on it. You can pay one and remove the indestructible counter to have another creature gain indestructible in the end of turn. Put a plus one plus one counter and a lifelink counter on that creature, and a plus one plus one counter and a lifelink counter on Arwen. <laughs> kind of similar to the last card a little bit, um, but better, I'd say. Way better. Yeah, way better. Yeah, I think this card's nuts. Yeah, this card's an A, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, it comes down, your opponent's not going to be able to attack into it, and then, yeah, just, it's going to spread around the love, give other things instructable. Yeah? Yeah. Just an A. Great. 
All right, next up, we've got Lotho. Lotho, maybe? Uh, Corrupt Sheriff. This is black-white for a 2-1. Halfling Rogue at rare. And it's a legendary creature. It says whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, lose a life and create a treasure token. Yeah, that's interesting, because that can be, like, a liability. Mm -hmm. Right? Because this triggers on both you and your opponent. And if you're low enough life, like, you just... You might not even be able to play this card. Yeah, I think... When you play it on turn two, though, it's, it's gonna be really good. Really good, yeah. It's it's, it's kind yeah, of yeah. ledger shredder ish in a lot of ways, right? Like really restricts your opponent from casting two things. It's not that hard to double spell on your turn often. So yeah, it's got that downside like you mentioned, where sometimes it is gonna be a little liability. But I just think when you have this in your opening hand, it's it's gonna be a real pain. I was just gonna give this like a C plus though, because like there's not a lot of double spelling that's gonna happen mm -hmm. early on, and then late on it is more likely that the treasure doesn't matter. Yeah, that's fair. Huh. I'm a little bit higher on it. Maybe I'm too high, but I just think like when when you trigger this once in the early game, getting that treasure, getting that card, you're gonna start to pull ahead, and then you know these fuels itself, you can start triggering it more. Obviously, yes, you can start to lose too much life, but I'm I was gonna give it a B minus. But you have a C plus, you said? Yeah, that's not okay. that different. Yeah, we're, we're basically yeah. kind of in the same spot. Okay. Next up, King of Oathbreakers. This is two black, white for a 3-3 three, three flyer. Legendary creature, spirit, noble at rare. Uh, when King of the Oathbreakers or another spirit you control becomes the target of a spell, it phases out. So for those who haven't encountered phasing before, it's almost like you put a cup over it. <laughs> Anything attached to it, an equipment, an aura stays on it. But that thing, you know, you phase out for the turn... It comes back on your next turn. And it also says, whenever King of the Oathbreakers or another spirit you control phases in, create a tapped 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. Yeah, so this, yeah, and, and that spirit also can phase out and phase in mm -hmm. again and, and keep making more spirits. Can't be, can't be, uh, none of your spirits die to removal, basically. Yeah, I think this thing's pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's just, <laughs> like... The downside of a 4-mana 3-3 three, three flyer often is it dies to reasonably efficient removal spells. And also, you know, that it can't block that well it turns and comes down. But you're mitigating one of those things entirely with upside. And sometimes you'll just, like, you know, cast a combat trick, get in for a few extra damage. I'm uh, sorry, I guess you can't actually do that. That won't actually work. But you'll, like, cast a 1-mana combat trick to make a 1-1 one, one sometimes. Mostly yeah, it's... you can turn your tricks into 1-1s into one, if you want. Yeah, exactly. Most of the time it's, it's just a protection ability. But a decent one. Hmm. I want to give this like uh, I don't I don't know like a, a B plus. Yeah, it's it's more like if you had a four mana three three flyer hex proof, what would you give that card? Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm rating it as yeah and it's a little bit worse than that right because it's they do have the choice of not taking lethal damage or whatever sure yeah so you want to go lower than that? no i don't think so i was just i was asking you like what, you, what would you think that is because i think his card is pretty similar to that i was just gonna give it a b okay yeah but it's a good card certainly um and, and you know but by the way a lot i know a lot of people are gonna be like oh but it never dies and like yeah that you, can, just, you don't have to kill this thing to win the game right it's not it's not like it says you can't lose the game on it your opponent can attack around it and stuff so um it's it's good but just not like totally busted next up we've got smeagol helpful guide one black green for legendary creature halfling horror it's a rare it's a four two and this is the beginning of your end step if a creature died this turn under your control the ring tempts you and whenever the ring tempts you, target opponent reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a land card. Put that card onto the battlefield tapped under your control and the rest into the graveyard. I think this card is really good. Yeah, this card is awesome. Oof. Yeah. Yep. I want to give this an A-, minus. I think. Yeah, I would give that too. Yeah, just being able to... The, the ramp is definitely relevant and you're going to be ramping a decent amount. Just, like, just attaching a ramp spell <laughs> onto all your things to tempt you. Like, that's basically... Like, you know, what's this going to do a lot of the time? Hmm. Yeah, it, you know, again, death triggers. Hard to, uh, not not always going to happen, but... Yeah, I like this. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. What's up next? All right, next is Shelob, Child of Ungoliant. Four black-green for an 8-8 eight, eight legendary spider demon with death touch, ward 2. Other spiders you control have death touch in ward 2. And whenever another creature dealt damage this turn by a spider you control died, 
create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a food artifact with the ability to pay two and sacrifice it <laughs> for green light for three life and loses all other card types. This is nice. Just a gigantic six mana creature, eight eight death touch, ward two, and then your thing your opponent's things dying to food that sometimes have passive abilities that matter. Yeah, passive even like the activated abilities still work, right? Uh yeah, true, yeah. And it's enter like, the battlefield yeah, effects. It's, static, it's just can't uh yeah, and enter the battlefield. Yeah, enter the battlefield effects, effects too. Everything. Attacking and blocking with it, so yeah. No, this card's good. This card's terrifying. Oh. As, as it should be. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great, and it's also like got a little bit of that belt and built-in protection of just cast giant dummy. Your opponent cast a cheaper removal spell, like they're gonna be trading on mana or at least close to even on mana a lot of the time. And if they don't have a removal spell, this thing just like it's it's kind of a funny thing where they don't want to take eight, but they also don't really want to trump this because then you get a little bit of value. So just it's just a great package all around. It's an A. Yeah, I'd probably give it... Yeah, I would say an A. I was going to say A-, minus, but I think it just does enough to be just the A. Yeah. All right, next up, we've got Galadriel of Lorth Lothlorien, correct? All right. Lothlorien, yep. there we go. <laughs> We're almost at the end, but I got one right. One green, blue for a 3-3 three, three legendary creature, Elf Noble at rare. Whenever the ring tempts you, if you control... Uh, sorry, if you choose a creature other than this one as your ring bearer, you scry three. And whenever you scry, you may reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land, you can put it on the battlefield tapped. This card is great. Yeah. Also, a lot, a lot of these cards that are kind of similar, just like these three mana cards that pay you off for the ring tempting you, and they're all pretty good. Well, this also pays you off for scrying. Like, it, yep. it, it will scry if the ring tempts you and trigger its second ability, but it'll also just trigger the second ability when you scry. Yeah, adding basically, like, turning your scries basically into a draw card a lot of the time. That yeah. That is a big upgrade in your scrying. Yeah, I have this as like another A minus. Yeah, great. All these, all, you know, one of the things too is these cheap cards we, we've seen a lot in the past. Just the the cheap bombs that give you a lot of value or must you know demand to be answered or else they just take over the game. Often overperform some of the more expensive bombs, and you know we've seen a few of those so far. And the interesting thing is that there's almost no A's in the, in the monocolor cards, but a lot of the gold ones are. And so, do you remember that land yesterday that taps for like two legendary colors? Yep you were lower on than i was yep. like this is part of the reason why i think that land's gonna be pretty good sure yeah i just pick those up and it will cast some of these powerful cards yeah i can buy that yeah what's up next next is elrond master of healing two green blue for a four four legendary elf noble whenever you scry put a plus moves encounter on each of up to x target creatures where x is the number of cards looked at while scrying this way and whenever a creature you control with a plus moves encounter on it becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls you may draw a card. There's so much support for this scry deck. Like, not just at rare, but a lot of builds around rares, but at the common and common level, too. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So, four mana, four, four, and your scries make your creatures bigger. Much bigger, honestly. Like, a lot of these, a lot of the time you scry, it's scry, too. And they're, like, putting two, the, two creatures get bigger. Sure, two, sorry, my bad, my bad, two creatures. Yeah. Yeah, and then like a pseudo, again, not not a protection ability necessarily, but disincentivizes your opponents from, uh, yeah, from targeting these things. Yeah, this card's good too. Yeah, I have this as another A minus. Yeah, nice A minus for Elrond. Flame okay. of Anor. This is one blue red for an instant at rare. Choose one. If you control a wizard as you cast a spell, you can choose two instead. The three modes are target player draws two cards, destroy target artifact, or flame of Anor deals five damage to target creature. Woo. Yeah, I don't think there's a ton of wizards though. No, just from my memory. So like, it's not going to be easy to get two. But if you do get two, this card's insane, right? Like, draw two, deal five to something is nuts. Even still, just like having the mode, like a modal card of three mana instant, draw two or deal five, like that's just a great card yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want? Do you want to give this one like? I don't quite want to go modal slash efficiency A, but I think it's like in the B plus range. Yeah, I was gonna go to B plus. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think it's like Gandalf is mostly the wizards you're gonna see i don't think maybe like one or two others but you're right not too many oh, of them uh, radagast should be a wizard oh yeah okay saruman would be a wizard yeah just yeah. like I, I didn't look at them but just they, like they have to be wizards and so there's there's, there's gonna be a few of them well here's one of them uh again off the gray is our next card three red blue for a three four legendary creature avatar wizard at rare whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell choose one that hasn't been chosen one you may tap or untap target permanent Two, get off the grade deals three damage to each opponent. Three, copy target instant or sorcery spell you control. You can choose new co uh, targets for the copy. Or four, you put Gandalf on top of its owner's library. 
Yeah, this card, uh, I think normally the first one you're going to choose is that third ability, because mm -hmm. like you'll just double up the first spell you cast. But it can also protect itself, and then like after doubling, the other two abilities are still going to be pretty good. So I think this card's like, even though it's understated, I, I think this card's pretty solid. Yeah, and, and it's like, I guess the, the the idea is after you've gone through them all, you're like, all right, put it on top, do it all again. Yep. Huh. I, I want to give it like a, like a B minus. Yeah, I'm a little bit... Yeah, I think I'd be there, too. I, I thought you might give it a higher, a bit of a higher grade, but the the, the stat line does dissuade me slightly. Um, but yeah, B-minus seems good for Gandalf. Sure. Uh, what's up next? Next, we have Mary Esquire of Rohan. Red-white for a 2-2 legendary halfling knight. Haste. First strike as long as it's equipped, and whenever you attack with it and another legendary creature, draw a card. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Just, you know, 2-2 haste. Not a bad stat line, and then... Once in a while, you send this in, draw a card, maybe team twice. Yeah, I think, yeah, like, I, I think you're going to want to have a legendary creature in play first, and mm -hmm. then you'll just cap this and immediately attack it. And, like, if you can hold up a combat trick there, that's it's going to be really good. Yeah, so, like, I think a 2 mana 2 2 haste is, like, a C. C, you know, be somewhere between C and C+, plus, and then add that at bonus, probably goes up to, like, the C plus B minus range. So Yeah, I'm going to give it a B minus. Yeah, let's give B minus to Mary. Okay. Uh, next up, we have A1, Fearless Knight. Two red white for a three four haste legendary creature of course a rare human knight when a1 fearless knight enters the battlefield exile target creature and opponent controls with greater power legendary creatures you control gain protection from each of that creature's colors until end of turn so if this hits something it's like nuts yeah <laughs> just like it, it's unblockable all the time Huh. Well, like, yeah, all your creatures become protection, and you're, like, killing something big, right? Like, it's... Well, the legendary creatures, right? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, all your legendary creatures, but it includes this and potentially, like, another. So you're getting in, like, damage with this, you're getting in damage with something else, you've got 3-4 body for 4, which is not bad, and you're, like, exiling basically their biggest thing. The thing is, like, how many 4-plus power creatures are there in the set? And not, like, tons. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a big range in, in how good this is. You're, you're going to, like, sometimes feel pressure on turn four when you have this in hand. You're going to look at the board. You're not going to have anything to hit. You're going to be like, do I keep it or do I, like, hold it a bit longer to try and get value off of it? And I think that it's going to be more often correct to not to just suck it up and play it on turn four. Yeah, I think so, too. But, yeah, the the ceiling on this card is ridiculous. Like, yeah, ceiling's great. Yeah. The floor is fine. B plus? Yeah, I think B plus is fair. Nah, sweet. All right, uh, last few ones here going to some three and three and above color cards. Sauron of Many Colors is our first one here. Three white, blue, black for a mythic avatar wizard legendary creature. It's a 5-4, so six mana for a 5-4. Ward, discard an enchantment instant or sorcery card. All right, it's kind of an a interesting ward cost. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, each opponent mills two cards. When one or more cards mill this way, when, sorry, when one or more cards are milled this way, exile target enchantment, instant, or sorcery card with equal or lesser mana value than that spell from your opponent's graveyard. Copy the exile card. You can cast the copy without paying its mana costs. Yeah, I had to read this like three times <laughs> just to just to just to probably understand it. Okay, so we've had this trigger before in this set. Whenever you cast your second spell, uh, each opponent mills two, and then so that's just like its own thing. And then when one or more cards are milled this way. Exile target enchantment, instant or sorcery card with equal or lesser mana value. To that spell, equal or lesser mana value, okay, from the spell that you cast, right? That's that's keying off your spell. Yeah, so you want to cast your, your lower mana value cost card first. Yep. And then your higher mana value cost second. And then you mill two, but it doesn't need to be just one of those two cards that you mill right. that it hit. That's right? just adding each time, just adding some selection. Yeah, it can be any enchantment, instant, or sorcery with equal or less mana value than the second card that you cast. <laughs> it's a weirdo. It's a very weird one, but I think it's I think it's quite good. Yeah, I think that so the ward cost is difficult to pay, right? Because you're not, like you're very rarely going to be like, okay, I cast my removal spell on this and also have another instant or sorcery or discard. I mean, maybe you do, but that's a really large cost you're paying, and then. Yeah. Most of the time, I would say, by the time you untap with this, and if you have your second spell, you're going to be able to cast a spell off your opponent's graveyard. Yeah, it, it is understated. Like a six yes. mana hard to cast 5-4 with no no additional board presence. 
is not great on defense. Like we've talked about a lot of these cards. So yes. there's, there's going to be certainly some spots where this is going to not help you despite going through all the hoops to cast it. Um, so I do think that docks the grade on it. Mm -hmm. But um, I still think this is like maybe still like a B, B plus. I was going to go B minus. Just I think that the six mana four. I mean, we'll be then. Yeah, six mana five, four and you know, three colors. You got you got to put, uh, you know, there's a bit of a draft cost in there too. But you know, it, it's, it's again, it's just such a, we're going to see. I'm sure after this, we play this at, we're going to be like, okay, we're really going to adjust our thoughts on this or that because there's so many of these cards that we've mentioned today and yesterday that, like you said, just like hope to untap with it. Pretty darn good when you can untap with it, but sometimes you just can't. So we'll, we'll reserve some judgment there. But if, if this if you're fine untapping with these kind of understated creatures, you don't mind taking a bit of a hit, then yeah, they're going to be a little bit better. Yeah, I do think that first, there's a lot of things that have like passive abilities like this. So you probably want to, in general, hold your, your removal spells in the set when you can. Mm -hmm, definitely. All right, what's up next? Next is Sauron the Dark Lord, three blue, black, red, for a 7 6 legendary avatar horror. It's got another weird ward cost. So, ward is sacrifice a legendary artifact or legendary creature. Uh, whenever an opponent casts a spell, amass one. Whenever an army you control deals combat damage to a player, the ring tempts you. And whenever the ring tempts you, you may discard your hand if you do draw four cards. Ooh. This is kind of just like a better version of the last card we saw. I mean, it doesn't do the same, the same abilities, but it's like a three color, six mana, but it's bigger and its abilities are better. Yes. And its ward cost is probably better too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so six mana, whenever your opponent casts a spell, a mass one, that's nice. Whenever an army control deals four. combat damage, the ring tempts you. That's going to come up sometimes, but then that whenever the ring tempts you, you can draw four cards. Discard your hand, but four is, four is a lot. Yeah, I do think the ward is easier to pay on this than it is on Saruman, though. I guess easier to pay, as in your opponent will be able to pay it, but I think probably more painful. Attacking an actual thing, you know? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm higher on this one than on Saruman. One like uh, A minus? Yeah, I was going to go A minus on Saruman. Yeah, cool. Okay. All right, uh, now we've got a four color card here Aragorn, the Uniter. This is four colors, four mana, everything but black, so red to green. White, blue for a 5-5 five, five legendary creature, human noble at mythic. And it's got one ability for each color, basically. So whatever you cast the white spell, create a 1-1 one, one white human creature soldier token. Whatever you cast the blue spell, scry 2. Whenever you cast a red spell, Aragorn deals 3 damage to target opponent. And whenever you cast a green spell, target creature gets plus 4, plus 4 until end of turn. Yeah, and worth noting, if you cast a gold spell, you will get multiple mm -hmm. of these triggers. Yep. So, um, and I do think that like there's enough fixing that we reviewed yesterday that these like three and four color cards are, are not like that hard to, to do if you want to do them. Yeah, and this like, you see that land, if, you're, if you're just playing like blue white and you have like that land that taps for two legendary colors, mm -hmm. like that just casts your, your red and green for this. Yeah, for you. exactly. Um, so this is worth it. I think if you see this, you know, not, you're not always going to take this over just like a good monocolor card. I mean, you probably shouldn't, but if you see this middle of the pack pick three, pick four, it's a thing worth going for. Like, it, it, it is something that, you know, some five-color cards or four-color cards, it's just like, like you know, last set we had the uh, Invasion of Alara, and that card ended up being passable, playable, but not just like, okay, I'm going to go for it, it's, it's going to be awesome, like the Kami War was in Kamigawa. This one's like in between the two, basically. Like, worth going for, and a little bit easier to cast too, um, but not just like straight busted like the Kami War was. So I'm going to give Aragorn kind of like build around E grade. You got to definitely commit some draft picks, but I think it's like a build around B plus. I, I wrote down B. Cool. So yeah, I'll, I'll put it for B plus. All right. Take us home, Mark. Our last card here. The last card is Tom Bombadil. He has the full Wooburg, white, blue, black, red, green for a 4 4 legendary God Bard. <laughs> as long as there are four or more lore counters among sagas you control. Tom has X-Proof and Indestructible. And whenever the final chapter ability of a saga you control resolves, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a saga. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom in a random order. This ability triggers only once each turn. Yeah, not uh, not for us limited players, I would say. No, there's like... It's kind of interesting. The, 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 uh, the long list of the Ents will get you four <laughs> more lore counters That's on cute, this. yeah. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, there's the sagas we revealed are mostly pretty bad. I think this is, uh, probably just enough. Yeah. I think this was, if this was a not hard to cast card, it would still be like, ah, oh, okay. Like, you know, you can be like, 
Still some hoops jump through, but the mana cost just makes it enough. So unfortunate to end this review on enough, but uh, it was good. I think, yeah, like you mentioned, we have a good mix of build around -y rares and rares that are good but not busted. Maybe 10 or so cards that are going to be like really awesome when they come down. But this, I, I would be very surprised if this turns out to be a, pr a very princely quote-unquote format. You, you said you wouldn't be surprised? I, I, would, be I surprised? would be surprised if it... Oh, sorry. I wouldn't be surprised if it... Wait. I would be surprised if it does. That's it. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be a princely format. You don't think it's going to be a princely no, format? No, I don't okay. think so. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, we didn't give out any A-pluses today, yeah. which is, I think, a good thing. I, I don't like A-pluses in sets in general. And the A's are mostly gold, so, like, you have to put in some work for them. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing this. I think it's going to be interesting, and, and the gameplay should be... We talked about this a bit yesterday, but scrying and, and drawing extra cards and looting is all going to give players more decisions to do. So yeah, I think I think it's going to be a good set. And before we, we wrap it up, I also wanted to again, you know, thank you for having me here, putting all the work for making all these uh, <laughs> slides and all the technology stuff and and putting the lights on and everything. So I really appreciate you having me, Alex. I mean, we will have you back as many times as you want to come back, Mark. Uh, fan favorite at this point. You were an instant fan favorite the first time you came back, but I can officially confirm that the people want more Mark, and uh, we'll give them as much Mark as we can get. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, everybody else, for listening. Uh, this is going up tonight, which is Tuesday, so you'll be able to listen to this before the pre-release or any events. Uh, you know, the, This comes on Arena next Tuesday, I believe, so a week from today. Pre-release events start Friday, and uh, I believe either this weekend or early next week, I'll be putting out my set overview episode, which after I've played with the cards during early access and a little bit during pre-release, you basically have some thoughts on those. So look forward to that if you want some more condensed thoughts, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.